call this uh, meeting to order the Montpelier City Council. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. Uh, we are going to make a just a, a shuffle of a couple things because part of the workshop, the TIF workshop, is going to be in private session, so we'll move that uh, to the end. We have, an, we have two agenda items. We'll just move those up and we'll do the council reports and so on beforehand so that people don't have to wait around for us to uh, uh, go out and be in public. So we'll just do that last. Um, and then I think uh, that's it. We have two, agenda, two addendum items. Anything else? Donna? I, I would like probably I don't do this now, but I would like to move the charter amendment filing with the clerk out of consent agenda. Okay, well we'll just go ahead and do that. That's uh, okay, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, if not, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Next item is general business and appearances. An opportunity for anyone who's here to talk about something that's not on our agenda to do so. I understand we have somebody here. Welcome. If you wouldn't mind just coming up to the uh, mic, introduce yourself. Hello. <coughs> Good evening. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Sarah Dusterhoft, and I'm an AmeriCorps member serving with the Vermont Youth Development Corps. I'm the team leader for the program. Uh, and I serve up at the Washington County Human Service Bureau office right in town. Uh, and I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention an event that I've been planning uh, for Martin Luther King Day uh, this coming Monday, January 15th. Um, every Martin Luther King Day is a day on, not a day off for AmeriCorps members. And AmeriCorps members all across the country, as well as community members, are encouraged to volunteer and be active in their community. Um, so I was responsible for putting together an event in town here and poster, poster for which uh, I have here, it's displayed around town. Uh, there will be a community lunch, a community dialogue, and art project at the Unitarian Church uh, on Main Street. And it'll go from 11 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Um, so of course the lunch goes from 11 to 12.30, um, and then at one o'clock we'll switch gears to the community event and the art project uh, that will focus on Martin Luther King's legacy, some of the issues facing our community, some of our strengths and ways that we can continue uh, the efforts of my Martin Luther King and the find his community to remedy some of those issues. Um, I think it'll be a wonderful opportunity to get to know the AmeriCorps members who are, um, I guess, around central Vermont. Uh, we have about 10 of us or so, maybe a few more. Um, so you'll see those faces there and, of course, community members as well. Um, I think it'll be a really wonderful time. So if you're able to attend or know someone who would be interested in coming, I strongly encourage and invite you to attend. Um, and I'll leave this poster on the back table, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, I have a second one, so if anyone wants to take one, um, post it somewhere they think it would be visible and useful for someone, um, that would be really wonderful. And I hope to see you all there. Um, it should be good food, good conversation, um, and I really thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for doing that. In America, it's a great program. Yeah, really. it is. I'm very, very yeah. glad to be part of it. Appreciate all the work that you all do. Thank you. <laughs> We've had great success with AmeriCorps Vista people yeah. in our yeah, city. Yeah, so. a lot of in the area, uh, a lot more than in lots of other states. So that's what yeah, it's a totally a great program. And I'll leave, I don't have business cards yet, but here's my contact information. <laughs> you will on the poster, so if anyone wants to get in touch with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, next item is the consent agenda, so we'll take off item B. Do we have a motion to approve the uh, item A minutes? I'll move to approve, but I just want to confirm that we will discuss it tonight as it's a, a timely measure to get it on the ballot. The intent is to make a decision tonight. Is that yeah, correct? the charter, yeah, 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 definitely. Move to approve, less. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we get to the presentation by Central Mount Public Safety Authority. Welcome. John, could we, if that's the case, could we go ahead and do the do charter amendment? Do you want to wait a few minutes while we do a couple other things? Sure. Well, Which, uh, I guess. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. We've got a couple other, I mean, we've got some other things we yeah, could do. We're just waiting for a couple members 
We'll, we'll just kind of keep going and raise your hand when you got who you want. We don't normally move this fast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Tom's shocked. Well, we to hear start that. out. We start out fast, and then we tend to. Yeah. Okay, uh, Donna, do you have any concerns or issues about the charter amendment? Well, I was to trying to understand this. Is it everything under a hundred thousand dollars? Or is it everyone is not charged their first hundred thousand dollars? The first ten thousand dollars of taxable property, um, if you have, or I should say, if you have ten thousand dollars or under of taxable property, your bill will be zero. So if you have more than ten thousand dollars of taxable property, then your complete property is taxed at the at the standard rate. So what it would do is mm -hmm. get rid of these really tiny bills that everybody hates. Um, the cost would be to the city between an eleven and twelve thousand dollars. Part of the reason why um, it's a good idea to do it now is that we're expecting much more than that to start coming in for the next tax year um, from you know some of these new businesses that are opening. So it'll be more than offset. So you know what it looks like. You know, I'm going to say this and give away my political colors, which everybody already knows. It's a distribution. Really, so it takes the pressure off the really smaller, you know, lower income businesses and, and leans it a little heavy, just sort of by default towards the bigger ones. It wouldn't change, though, the, the rate for the bigger ones. It's not going to change the rate. So it's, it's, just, just, it's just a charter change that would exempt, you know, little tiny businesses that end up with $20, $30 bills. It would change, it's going to change the rate for everybody by $11,000 for all property tax players, including personal property taxes. Well, in the sense that it would be offset. See, when, when you say that, you confuse me, Bill. <laughs> when you say for everybody for the first $10,000. Well, no. So it's, the, the numbers happen to be consistent. So there's the value of 10000 Right. That, that we're talking about exempting. That results in 11000 we won't collect in personal right. property yeah, I understood taxes. That. Yep. So all of those are part of the grand list. So when we set the taxes next year, we won't have oh, that, that group of so so. Every, okay. the, all, the entire grand list will have to pick up that eleven thousand dollars, which is one point one two cents or something like that. And one divided by eight, something quick. <laughs> one two five. I'm right? sure, as yeah. written, yeah. it would work that way. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it would not only other personal property taxes, but regular per property taxes would have to will absorb that difference. That's that's what I'm saying. And this is a low enough marker because one of the pieces we got was a comment about not putting all of it on the bigger businesses so is it <coughs> equitable in that way well I'm not sure what you're asking um, it, it's it's it, it, it's looking at it from the opposite direction it's looking at it from John John wasn't I'm not trying to cut mm -hmm. you off here but I know what she's referring to it was an want. email we got right so oh. Jean asked about what would happen if we exempted everybody under 500,000 Ooh. <laughs> and the, well, the idea would be more oh. business friendly. And it turns out the bulk of our money is in the 500,000s and over, about 75% of it. And, but it's only seven accounts. Um, so I just posed the question, is there an issue of, are you creating a tax for seven accounts to bring in this money? And it, where's the equity standard? You know, oh, Burlington, yeah. okay. I know Burlington, for example, exempts their bottom 40,000. Um, but you know, I, I just don't know where that line is drawn, or if there is a. Oh heavens, yeah. Then you just talking about eliminating all of it. But. Then you're just whopping a tax on on a right. very small handful. I mean, right. okay. you know, okay. I'm going to get out there and support it, but I couldn't support that. Right. Well, the, that so there's the politics of it, but then the, I, I, there's also the legality. Is mm -hmm. it, can we actually do that? Is that a, a well? How would that? I don't understand that. We're drawing a line. It's just a matter of where you draw the right. line. Right. So, but is there? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Is, would somebody, could they if say you draw the line too small, line? then you're going to set up an argument that they're specifically being targeted. This is an arbitrary tax. tax that is just targeting them and a few other businesses. And he, you know, it's got to go through the legislature too. So, and we, the we, argument may not stand up, but it's an argument to be made, and it could be a compelling one. And it has to pass the legislature. So. Okay, uh, yes. Jean and then uh, <coughs> I, I, I wanted to go back to the concept of, of drawing the line and this this was these questions today and thank you Bill for the info um, were really spurred by uh, the question that Burlington is asking about 
uh, if to charge the personal property tax, if, if to continue with that, um, do they want to bring more business into Burlington? What does this tax mean for folks? Does it, does it, does it, and I don't know about this. Do these taxes uh, for the smaller businesses would a business think, no, I'm not coming into Montpelier because I don't want to pay $214, which I think is, you know, sort of an average of, of one of these categories, or is that so small? Um, on the other hand, we we see our downtown struggling, and uh, so can we? Is this a bit of a carrot? So I don't have any. I don't have the answers. Well, I just thought we should ask. Right. So it's my opinion, this isn't um, based on any factual study, but I think you're, you're honest. I mean, it's the people with the big, the people that we, in theory, might not be exempting are the ones that actually could be making location because they're in the thousands of dollars. I know for Caledonia Spirits, for example, they have lots of business personal property, all their tanks and all their equipment, and it was a real factor for them. It was, you know, we're looking at other communities that don't have this, you do. Um, you know, if... Green Mountain Power decided to build a new facility, you know, they might say, well, if we build it in Middlesex, we won't have to pay this large tax every year. You know, that, so that, so it seems to me, and you know, I think that's what Burlington's looking at is completely doing, you know, Barry's done away with it, other places have, others haven't. Um, we can certainly get the li list of those that have and haven't. I mean, it's, it's a certainly a long discussion. You know, if, if you're doing it to attract business, my suggestion would be to, to get rid of all of it, but understanding you're putting $440,000 onto the, all the taxpayers. Um, you know, you're shifting it from this one group of taxpayers onto the general tax rate, including their, you know, those people's property taxes too, but it, it's about five, what did I say, 5.1 cents on the overall tax rate. Yes. Can I just, as the person who's really pushed this, including going back a year, I am going to express some frustration that I've been talking about this for a year, and now the day it absolutely has to go through, we're talking about it. Um, that's a little frustrating, and it'll be frustrating to Steve, too. But can I just say this was – put it to the voters. You're not making the decision today. You're, you're talking about putting something to the voters. Let the voters have it. And I would say don't mess with a good thing. I mean, it's not something designed to bring in business. It's something designed to give a break to our smallest businesses. And uh, that as itself is – I think it's a good enough cause – you know, we don't necessarily have to pile all of our wish list onto that wagon. But if you like this mechanism, then I would say talk about it again next year. Um, but, you know, don't, don't um, throw out the baby with the bathwater here. This is, this is a nice thing we can do for the small businesses in town. And if we overcomplicate it, boom, we'll just blow it up. I don't think we're about to throw it out. I think, but I think it's appropriate. The council has to vote on it, and I think it's appropriate for us to have a conversation about it. I don't think that's you know, okay. Don't I mean, it can be done by petition out. too. It um, seems to me that the issue isn't. So, to John, I think just to help out here, I don't think the council is arguing about the the exemption. I think it's a question of the policy of do we continue this tax in general, and what are the and. But that's that such a dramatically different policy I question. Understand. That's right. all I'm saying is yeah. that's a whole other kettle of fish. Well, or where you draw the line. I mean, you've drawn it at one place. There's an argument to make it to draw that line. On a different, and the higher we draw the line, the more it's going to shift onto the I general. I mean, I'm not right. making that argument, but I'm just saying that's a worth. It's not an unreasonable conversation. And I think, Gene, you're the one who raised that. Said, so if you've been, did you have? Any, uh, no, I, I, I agree with you, John, in the sense that tonight isn't the night that we're going to draw any line elsewhere. I do think, though, the council moving forward um, can can begin to think more broadly about the impacts of this tax and um, the consequences and maybe or maybe not make, make some changes. So, and, you know, just as an example, I think I sent to you, in 98, the city council did proposed to the voters to do away with that tax and proposed to phase it out over five years, and the voters turned it down by 900 to 1,200 or something like that. Mm -hmm. so they did put it to the voters. I just, and, and I agree with, with John. I think that this needs to go to the voters. I think that's what our role here is, is to present that to the city and see what the city has to say, but I, too, share some of those same concerns. I mean, I guess I'm also struggling with shifting that burden onto 
you know, property taxpayers because that means rents are going to go up and, and that means other things are going to happen that might be unintended consequences. But I absolutely agree that this is something that should go to the voters. I mean, I think our job here is to facilitate their ability to vote on these things that affect their city directly. And, and you know, many of them are property taxpayers, so they, they might, you know, be interested in what that means and they're business owners. And, and so I just, I, I do want to revisit the policy conversation you know, depending on how this vote does or doesn't go, I guess. I think it's a worthwhile policy conversation that we as a council need to spend some time thinking about. I think Justin's first. Well, I certainly can appreciate uh, not wanting to shift the burden of these taxes onto uh, property owners. An easy way to avoid that would be to contain uh, future budget spending by $11,000, and uh, then it would not be necessary to shift that burden. Um, I'm in favor of eliminating this uh, petty and burdensome tax. Uh, it mostly is targeted at small businesses, uh, people who are just getting started, and frankly, I think we would benefit from having more of them here. Uh, I would be in favor of exploring future relief, uh, but given the, the productive uh, and functional nature of this budget cycle in particular, I certainly am not willing to do that at this time as uh, we're very close to finalizing our budget, and the impact of that would be undue and unfair on the city manager. I just wanted to add a comment from the economic <coughs> development study we did and the consultant that came in and he said the one thing that he found was that our level of taxing as it is to businesses is not a factor of them not coming here. I mean, it was in the study. So I think this is a fair way to approach it to start with the smaller businesses. It isn't that I object to it, John, or that I don't want to put it to the voters. I just wanted to talk about it. So I would move that we approve the charter change amendment as put forth. Do all I have to go to each four? one of them? No, you can do all four, all four together. Ones. Okay. It's basically moving to file. The formal action is filing the language of the charter amendments with the clerk. It has to be done at least 10 days before the public hearing, which is okay. in 14 days. So if I read this here, I make the motion to file the attached charter amendments with the city clerk to replace amendments filed on January 3rd, 2018. Second. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, you guys ready to go? Okay. Presentation by the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Do a short PowerPoint presentation. Speak up, Tom. You're not getting in the mic. Okay. Thank you, Donna. I can't hear you. That's really strange, John. You should be used to it by now. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mumbler, wasn't it? Well, well, so let me introduce everyone before we start. Now, have John, you can turn off the light. But thank you, everyone, for having us. Obviously, this is an update and uh, um, <clears throat> presentation of our budget request for this uh, fiscal year. A lot has happened since the last time uh, we met. Uh, we met with the Barry Council last night. Um, where this plan was general was received with uh, a general positive vibe. You know, <laughs> they had some uh, critical feedback that we were, we're taking back to the board uh, to discuss, uh, to see what can make it better, how we can work forward, and how we can sort of come to some conclusions on uh, the role of CDPSA and, and how it can help uh, with the process of regionalization as we go forward. Um, you know, part of the change in focus or direction that we're going to be presenting tonight came about from a meeting that Bill Frazier, myself, Donna, and uh, Chief Fakus and Chief Gowans had uh, about a month ago where we discussed what would be the role of the CDPSA and how could we be most effective over the next, uh, you know, 12 months and, and to, to come to some type of conclusion in this venture, whether it's up or down or whether uh, we move forward or not. And, and uh, from that meeting, uh, you know, one issue that has been highlighted uh, continuously has been the need to address <coughs> infrastructure first and to be able to control some uh, some of the problems that are facing uh, both Barry and Montpelier, as well as Capital West. <coughs> and I apologize, <coughs> I've had a cough for the past couple of days, so I'm kind of working through that cold. So from that discussion, we've kind of take it back, taken it back to our board, and we come back with a proposal of how we can go forward over the next year. Um, We'd like to do it with no funds needed or no requests from the towns going forward, but we realize that we're probably going to with the funds we have, and we've been we've been good stewards with the funds that have been allocated from the two towns. 
Um, we still have about $40,000 left in, in reserve funds, and, and we're prepared to use that in this final year to proof of value. Um, with that, we feel that will get that us to October or so, October, November time frame. Um, from there, if we're successful, we feel we'll need extra funds. And this proposal really is geared towards that. You know, how do we get, if we are successful in what we're proposing between now and November, how do we get from November to um, the following June? Um, we could potentially not ask for funds this year, but I think that would be disingenuous to the voters. I think the voters have a duty and an obligation to understand. If we feel we're going to go down the path and get to levels where we think we will be, we will need some funds to really push us through and get us to the next level. Um, that being said, we've offered trigger points, uh, exit strategy, uh, that when we get to the point in November where these things aren't working or we haven't met these obligations or Capital West hasn't decided to join us as a third member, we can get out and we can give back the money. And so we're kind of, we feel it's, it's better to ask for money and give it back than to not ask for money, be successful in, in our proposal and then have to come back to you guys in, in October and November, November and ask for, for a set of funds. So that's the reason for the budget request. Um, from here, I'd like to play a little clip. Um, Can I that, ask you just before you go forward about the budget yep. request, are there any offsetting savings that you're projecting to the city from the revenue oh. that would be raised locally? I, I, I offsetting guess savings to city to Montpelier from the money that we would be allocating. So you're asking for 20, I don't know, whatever your number is. Are yeah, 25, 28,000. 28,000. 28,200. Well, the idea of the authority has always been to consolidate, to gain efficiencies, then reduce by... Well, reduce it's long-term. The goal of authority has always been sure. to long-term create a system of which we can expand regionalization in police, fire, emergency services, as well as dispatch. It's never been just about dispatch. It's always about, been about creating a system of where we can not go it alone from Montpelier's perspective. Right now, you, you're functioning as a regional entity in the police department through their dispatch operations. You have uh, contracted obligations that have limited terms that could end to within you know, a six-month notice from Capital West. I'm not saying that's going to happen. Times could change. Uh, as we get closer to the end of that contract term, I think it, it exposes Montpelier taxpayers to a significant amount of risk. I think what this proposal offers is a way to spread that risk. Um, does it provide immediate savings for Montpelier? No. I think Barry City had those same concerns last night. However, one of their concerns uh, was raised by Mayor Lawson in that would the board consider um, if this thing is successful, amortizing some of the previously spent costs from Montpelier and Barry over the lifetime to be spread out by the new members, um, either through bonding or through you know, integration of the single site system or that. So it is definitely a concern that we don't want to be an extra burden forever. Um, we feel there is a finite life to the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority if it isn't successful, and that's why we're offering these exit strategies. Um, so with that, I'll Play this clip, and then what we're going to do is we're going to give it over to Paco. And then we'll bring you a story from Paco. And he can explain our proposal. Paco. Public post to VPR's coverage of cities and towns from around Vermont. Vermont's emergency responders rely on radio communications to talk to each other in critical situations. The clear lines of communications are not available in all parts of the state, as VPR's Amy Noyes discovered. the sound of a French Canadian taxi company coming in loud and clear at the Capital West Dispatch Center located at the Montpelier Police Department. Capital West dispatches 23 fire ambulance and EMS services throughout central Vermont on the same frequency as the taxi company. They also share the radio frequency with the Barry City Police Department, which dispatches several more agencies. Scott Bagg is chairman of the Capital Fire and Mutual Aid System Communications Committee, which runs Capital West Dispatching. He says all that radio traffic can be confusing. So it can be very complicated when you're trying to dispatch on a fire emergency and here comes these Canadian taxi company trying to talk and operate their, their business and it overrides our system. As frustrating as all this radio traffic may be, the situation worsened earlier this year when communications from fire departments in Grand Isle County started coming in loud and clear over that same radio frequency. 
Bag explains a recent equipment upgrade for the Grand Isle system led to more interference for dispatchers and responders in central Vermont. They um, actually attempted to get off our frequency, and they have recently had realized that their system did not work for what they needed. They came back to on our frequency, and their transmissions were overriding our transmissions and became an uh, operating problem. Fred Cummings is the dispatch supervisor in Montpelier. He says too much radio traffic can lead to dispatchers missing transmissions, and that, he says, can have life or death consequences. If the transmission that you miss is critical, it could mean somebody is hurt or killed. So that's the concern that we have with, with everybody being able to talk on the same channel at the same time. Communications Committee Chairman Scott Bagg says there haven't been any dire consequences yet, but he's afraid it's only a matter of time. And that's why Capital West is looking to switch to a new system on a new frequency. But the switch will take time and money. He says the Federal Communication Commission needs to approve the change, and because it's close to the international border, Capital West will also need permission from the Canadian government. That process could take almost a year. And if they change frequencies, Bag says it's also a logical time to upgrade the Capital West communication system that's been patched together over several decades. We want a system that is able to transmit and reach all of our towers simultaneously at the same time. And we want our responders, no matter if they're in Cabot or Roxbury, to hear each other and be able to talk to each other through a, a unified, dedicated system. And it will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace. Bag says Capital Fire and Mutual Aid will apply for a Department of Homeland Security grant and other grants to help pay for the new system. He says he doesn't think it's viable to ask the 17 towns whose departments use Capital West Dispatch to pay for the upgrade. It would be extremely difficult for all the towns to bear the weight of such an upgrade. I would almost say impossible. In the meantime, Capital West is making do with a crowded radio channel and a complicated system to reach emergency responders from Cabot to Faston and Roxbury to Walden. And Bag says it's a problem that's likely to come up in other parts of the state as well. As more and more technology and radios come available, more and more people are trying to talk on the same frequency. We've run into this problem and I'm sure that other agencies are going to run into the same problem. Meanwhile, Grand Isle County fire officials have been in touch with Capital West and Montpelier and say they're making an effort to restrict radio use to essential communications, at least until a more permanent solution can be found. For VPR News, I'm Amy Noyes. I played not, not to scare you guys, but it's a reality that's going to face this council regardless if this EVPSA is here or not. Um, you have a contract with Capital West, you will need to partner with them in some way, shape, or form to come up with some way to fix this. And as a taxpayer of Montpelier, I would not like to be the recipient or the, the, the person that needs that fourth call or fifth call because we're having problems with dispatching in Worcester or, or out in the outer areas because of our contracted services. So the basis of this discussion is not to highlight the problems, but to highlight how we, as the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, can use this as a way to um, <coughs> help to solve a problem or help to come bring the council together with Capital West as a, as a new member. And we have a critical meeting next week. Part of the process has been working with Capital West to, to join. Uh, we had a meeting in December with them where it was unanimously voted at that meeting to pursue discussions with Montpelier and Barry in, in becoming members. And, and one of the problems or one of the discussion points we've had heard loud and clear at the council level says, well, we, we need another member. And I think Capital West becomes a, a, a member that could be an uh, integral partner to help us solve some of these problems, as well as solve some of the common policies and protocols that are uh, required. Um, you know, Montpelier does a great job. We can't do it alone. And, and I think if you take anything from this message, regardless of what happens with CVPSA over the next six months, that will need to be part of your capital equipment budget. It will need to be part of your steady state financing plan. It will need to be considered how you spread those costs needs then to be part of the equation. So with that, I'm going to throw it over. I just ask you a question about Capital West. Would that sure. require a, a positive vote of every jurisdiction that's a member of that of Capital West in order to join the authority? No. So in other words, every select. No, board. we've had a legal opinion that says they can join it. Um, uh, Paul Giuliani, Paul Gillis has told us that they're eligible to become a municipal so it's a member. a separate entity, Cap 
it's a separate what? entity that has their own funding formula. They'd have to agree through a memorandum of understanding to uh, whatever funding requests we have. And so theoretically, if they become a member, they would be part of the equation. And, and whatever goes forward would then be split amongst them based on some funding formula that's to be determined. But it's um, a separate yeah. municipal entity, Capital West? Is they have their own municipal entity. Um, We've been given legal advice that they have limited ability for bonding. They've told us they have ability to bond. I think there is uh, some some um, interpretation that needs to be clarified, whether or not they can bond alone or not. Um, if they can't, it would have to even come to Montpelier or some authority that does, whether it's Barry City or the Central Rock Public Safety Authority. Um, we feel we could be the, uh, the glue that holds these together and offers a, a, a place where uh, issues and ideas can be vetted on a more regular basis than what council uh, usually entails. This has come about from our meetings with Bill that this could be a highlighted function that uh, just, be, just with Montpelier alone, as we had highlighted before, it really didn't make sense to turn over the employees and cause undue hardship or concern at this point. We still hold true that that eventually would be a logical extension, but we, we wanted to focus on uh, measurable uh, goals over the next six months so we can prove value, and if not, we can jettison the project and view it as a, a lost cause. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Paco to present our budget request, and then we can answer any questions. Thank you. I, I don't know if you want the PowerPoint presentation. I, I did. think the people at home might. It would be good to have it on the record. Right okay. Then, uh, I don't know how to activate oh. it. So. Oh. Oh, okay. I, mean, I got it here, but... Uh, Who's got the clicker? Oh, there it is. How does this work? You got it? Sorry. Signals have come up. No, nope. let's see. I think it's a second. Thank you, Mike. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Yep, thanks, John. Well, uh, hello, everybody, um, and uh, thank you for letting us be here. I, I, I want to uh, see if I can add some. Just a little bit of clarity to what the, the chair mentions. It's my understanding about Capital Fire that they are a municipal district uh, established by law, and as such, they they are a municipal entity that would allow them to join the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. The question uh, about their funding is still at an issue. The question as to whether they can vote as an organization to join our Central Vermont Public Safety Authority is not a question. They can vote independent of uh, funding. They may have to go back and uh, seek funding from their municipal or from their towns uh, if there is an, an investment. But that is something that we want to uh, continue to pursue and plan for down the road. Now, over the last uh, several months, we have presented, I, I have been involved with preparing three separate plans for uh, dispatching. Uh, two of them involved what I call the two-center concept, and those were uh, not well received, and we always left with more questions than we were able to answer at the time. Um, after our last um, visit, we prepared another plan, and as a result of that, it really boiled down to and or the feedback we got was the only way to advance dispatching is to look at a single uh, center or single site facility. And there was a strong suggestion from staff that the real problem with communications in central Vermont is the radio system, as you've heard from this clip, which is why we prepared this clip. And it is why we have focused on our efforts the rest of 2018 to uh, develop a single site dispatching plan and to try and advance the uh, project of developing a analog 
simulcast radio system. And that's at the heart of the operating budget proposal for fiscal year 19. A funding, the funding proposal calls for continuing with an executive director working on developing a single site dispatching plan and advancing the new simulcast radio system while working collaboratively with Capital Fire and Capital West. We're going to continue funding the bridge between the uh, Barry City Dispatch and the uh, Montpelier Dispatch Center. It's important to remember that while our appropriation, uh, while our, our budget for fiscal year 19 is level funded at 100,000, we are reducing the appropriation request by 40%. Um, uh, we intend to use $40,000 of reserve funding. Uh, that is projected reserve funding. It's not that we have 40,000 uh, sitting in reserve at this point, but we are projecting by the end of this fiscal year to have approximately $40,000 in reserve to put towards the fiscal year 19 budget. That leaves Montpelier's contribution that we're requesting at 28.2 and Barry City contribution at 31.8. Now, we realized that um, this is our fourth year of funding request, and we realized that we needed to come in with some concrete ideas about what we're going to do to for performance and more importantly we want to articulate the deliverables that meet those performance expectations so as the chair um, as Tom has mentioned we are ongoing we have ongoing talks with capital fire mutual aid system about joining CBPSA that is one of the deliverables to have them as a member of CBPSA a deliver deliverable for the simulcast radio system project is the plan for funding and acquisition of a new s system that will be delivered uh, no later than November 2018. Uh, a plan for a single site dispatch center delivered no later than November 2018. Uh, we tend intend to have this legislative uh, and use this legislative session to aggressively track S 273 which is a bill that has been proposed in Senate Government Ops. It deals with a variety of issues to include the removal of the 911 call taking function from state police and the creation of a public safety planning grant program that would be, uh, the grants would be given to regional planning commissions. And then finally, uh, we want to establish some ag aggressive, uh, organized public outreach and to distribute the comments and feedback from those public outreach sessions, of which we plan on having a minimum of three, to include uh, helping to facilitate perhaps a meeting of both city councils again to hear from um, the city councils relative to their uh, integration, regionalization, and consolidation ideas. Um, the deliverables, there's no magic to the deliverables we're planning towards for the fall so that we can have a discussion uh, around those plans and a go, no-go decision <coughs> to coincide with the beginnings or the, the, the fiscal year 20 budget process. Along with the performance expectations, we have uh, realized that we need to articulate an exit strategy and uh, what's going to happen moving forward. The deliverable is all the reports and plans should be delivered to the city councils for action by November 2018. And no action or not moving forward in any way spells no further work by the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Um, I've established in, uh, I've put up here a couple resources. This is a link uh, why a simulcast radio system to the audio that you just had, and that is our website. Um, and that's pretty much uh, a summary of uh, our budget proposal for fiscal year 19, establishing uh, why we're asking for it and uh, what we intend on presenting with the funds. Thank you, uh, Paco. Uh, uh, would you please explain why is that bill in the Senate so important? 
I don't think it was clear why we care about that bill. Oh, well, it, it leads to, uh, it will lead, we expect that it will lead to a discussion about the state police at least getting out of the uh, 911 call handling uh, business, which will mean that the enhanced 911 board will have to redistribute how the call handling, 911 call handling function will be handled in Vermont and who will handle it. And I think we need, we in Central Vermont need to be very uh, mindful and watchful of where the 911 calls in Central Vermont may go and be handled. Along with that, I expect that there will be a discussion concerning dispatching and the cost of dispatching by the Vermont State Police and, and to whether they will uh, get out of the dispatching business for municipalities or whether they will charge municipalities for that service. That's a game changer for many, uh, uh, well, it's a game changer for 105 municipal agencies that are currently being dispatched for free by the Vermont State Police. One of which is Berlin? Yeah, one of which is Berlin. That's why yeah. I feel that's And I'm glad you're North. pursuing that. It seems, seems to me just to be a, just an incredibly inequitable system. Mm -hmm. It is. It and begs, and begs uh, uh, correction, it, in my it's, view. It's always been the stumbling block for us when 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 I hear people talk about trying to uh, increase the market. Yeah, we get this freebie. So why, why would we pay if we get it for free? It's that simple. It's just not fair. It, it's been the huge stumbling block in adding new municipal members, uh, particularly yeah. the local municipal members. Why should we pay um, when we're getting it for free? So if there are no other questions for the authority, I'd be interested in hearing from Tony, if you're able, just to respond in part because so much of this is premised on what is viewed as a, a flaw or vulnerability of our existing dispatch center so, uh, system. So I, if you're, I mean, I hadn't talked to you about this, but if you're, I assume this is not a new topic, so if you're able to respond and just talk generally about the proposal, that would be very helpful. Sure. Uh, from a general perspective, uh, I absolutely concur with everything that has been said. This is a, a vast one time with some fundamental differences in Montpelier's current and, and, uh, liability, if you will, and some things that are happening in the landscape uh, in terms of technology and who owns what, how that can be <coughs> uh, funded. Uh, I just spoke with Chief Taylor, Gary Taylor, yesterday of St. Albans Police Department. Um, one of the, and Chief Taylor um, presented was two years ago, I think, to the CBPSA about their model. St. Albans owns the equipment that pushes out the signal uh, to their clients. And Chief Taylor advised me just yesterday that their revenue went from $600,000 to $300,000 this year. They're all spending on that equipment. Uh, what I absolutely agree, I'm not saying that with or without CDPSA, but one thing that is in our in Montpelier's best interest, as well as capital, fire mutual aid, and the, the component of that, which is Capital West. Those are the folks that we're actually contracting with those accounts. Mm -hmm. That we do absolutely need to move beyond the, the contract um, to a, uh, even more of a partnership. We certainly laid, uh, I think, a very strong foundation the last five years, for this last five years for that partnership. So that is um, the, the, the difference with our current contract and how it's structured. They own the equipment. So, if, in other words, uh, since I've been, as Bill knows, since 2007, I've been incredibly cautious about building out a a large business model that I could not always be sure I could maintain because we're talking about Montpelier employees, Montpelier expenses, just to, to meet contractual needs. But um, the relationship with capital is so strong, I took this leap of faith because uh, yeah, in 2008 or whenever the challenges were occurring between Barry Town and Barry City, I absolutely refused to take on Barry Town uh, because we just didn't, at that time, we didn't have the, the infrastructure or capacity. I mean, times have changed. But um, so, so is this system needed? Yes. How we get there, it's going to require bonding. And and I also think that um, you know, Bill's example of the how we deal with wastewater is a is a perfect example of infrastructure is purchased collectively and then a long term contract. Something that's got to yeah, if you have to have skin in the game. Then the other, uh, and also talking to some of my colleagues in Kidding County. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of, you know, right out of the gate, uh, a lot of pitfalls right now of what the 
proposed in looking at Jimmy County. Uh, they're kind of ending up with some, in some similar directions to I think where the CBPSA is now. Um, but I also want to make clear this from what I see. This is absolutely um, not going to be cost savings. I think we need to be really clear on that, especially if we do what may or may not, uh, because of, of, of 273, for example, we have to become not only a dispatch center, but a one step, as we've heard in the past, PSAP. We're not going to be able to do that, certainly out of the two locations, and, and we're not big enough to do it out of Montpelier, even if we add the third floor and with the Serrano proposed. Um, and then that, that would be that standalone facility that's solely dedicated to to, uh, to communications. So, so that's um, so otherwise right now, and I'm concerned about what Barry City is as always. What 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 does Barry City want to do? They also have some clients that are part of Capital Fire Mutual Aid, but they um, they have a contract with the Barry City Police Department. So again, where does that all fit in? Because otherwise we have Montpelier. Have Capital West, and, then, and we, and with or without the CBPSA, we are moving in that partnership direction. And Montpelier, uh, for now, would be is the fifth, well, even currently is the fiscal agent. So, so can I say? So it sounds like you agree that, or maybe you can just say, do you agree that they have a, the vulnerability that they described with the competing frequencies is a is a real one? And if Absolutely. that's the case, then what? Assuming the authority doesn't happen, or if the authority didn't happen, what would be the plan for addressing that within the Montpelier? Is that assuming that the, you know legally, Capital West as a as a as a statutorily defined municipality, if you will, is Capital East and Capital West, that they can bond. And I don't know what that looks like. For example. Uh, for an individual town, like Cap, you know, let's say Cabot chooses, no, we don't want any part of this. What is, I don't know how that works. Um, and then Montpelier would be in on that bond, Barry City would be on that bond, as well as Barry City's clients. So there are a lot of moving pieces there. Um, you know, but I, I, but I think an end game is, you know, all, all these communities have to say we have to have skin in the game. Because um, seeing how things are unraveling, using most recently, it, um, it's happening in St. Albans because of a, a new stand-up uh, described as a very small um, independent communication center in Middlebury. Um, for example, that was just one of the things that, that pulled some of the clients away. So for long-term public safety stability, you know, I, I want to be really clear that we need to, all of us need to try to avoid these contractual relationships. Uh, I've also had a conversation um, with somebody that is uh, had a lot of, I think, influence um, in helping Senator White with, you know, with drafting of 273. It's, it covers a lot of big issues, and I don't know really what the, the honest expectations are of this bill. It has to do with from the police training to, um, you know, suddenly went from dispatching, throwing in the whole peace act. And I will tell you, the Vermont chiefs are very concerned, and, and, and I will be testifying on 273 um, and various components of it. Um, but it is not in the best interest for right now public safety for the state to get away from doing the PSAP aspect of communications. But certainly, um, and I, I, had, I did have the opportunity back in November to tell the committee uh, the concern about the, you know, the inequity of, of how they currently bill and not bill. So just will oh, I'm sorry. Go sorry, ahead. can you, Go ahead, what, what's email. PSAP? I oh, <laughs> sorry, public service answering point. It's not okay. a call taker. So okay. you, if right now in the room, if I call 911, uh, it's most likely going to be answered by a 911 call taker in most likely Williston. They're going to take the initial information. They're going to see that it's a, it's a medical call in Montpelier City Hall. They're going, to then, they're going to contact our dispatch to get now the, all the, de the real detailed information about the call and give it to the Montpelier Fire Department to get the resources to what they need to do. So that's why I mean by two step. Uh, a single step facility would be still have your dedicated call takers, but they're going to be in the same proximity. So the dispatcher's seeing real time, boom, like we have this 911 call, or they could even be the same person, depending on how it's trained. And then you get into other things that we don't have in Vermont, such as emergency medical dispatching, which is a certain, these are all standards, but you have to have a lot of technical technology in place and systems. And uh, so we have to think, I think, uh, and I would, you know, where I agree with the board anyway, uh, we have to think big and really um, strategically on this. But I, like I said, the landscape is changing radically. 
um, right now. And, and the one thing that I'm, uh, I am comfortable with is that we have a strong partnership in relationship with Capital West. So if we're moving forward with it, strengthening that relationship with Barry and Capital West to for, uh, Bear, uh, with uh, Capital West. Not just Bear. Capital West, not Barry? Well, I mean, uh, Barry, we'd like to. I mean, we've come a long way because of the authority in mm -hmm. terms of our So just Capital West is the, is the entity that we have a relationship with. Right, that's who we have the contract. So if, our, if we're working on strengthening that and dealing with the uh, technological problems that exist, what, and you said, I think you said, we don't, I can't expect any cost savings with this proposal. So what advantage do you see from What's us in for supporting the safety, we need this, this communication system? Right, but I think you were saying you're moving that direction anyway, so I'm trying yeah, to I understand so what so advantage one, we so get from CVP, funding the city. Let me just make sure I so people understand the question. I just want to understand the advantages or, or, or disadvantages from continuing to support the public safety authority based on the technological limitations of our existing system. They say you're planning to fix, understand you have a plan to do that, and, I, and I'm just trying to understand for us, I don't know about others, but I'm trying to understand does this make sense for us economically or some other basis uh, for us to pursue? What makes sense is that we have to bond. At some point, that's that's one point they can never be out. But we don't need an authority to bond. I mean, we can that's do correct. that That's part ourselves. of that's a policy conversation on that side because <coughs> one scenario could be that the city of Montpelier, um, through partnership, somewhat using the wastewater uh, treatment center plant as an example, we would partner with Capital West. There's a lot of legal things that have to be made sure that we're absolutely clear on. And then most likely, what is our our capacity as fiscal agent, we're the ones to manage that, um, and using it, have, uh, so that's one one example. And then, but, but that's a same radio, radio frequency that Barry City would be utilizing at Barry City's clients. So, um, but it's something that we're we, we're going to we all of us, which is Barry City, Barry City's clients, all the members of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid, which goes even beyond our, our you know, which even is even broad and other that neither of us dispatch for. Um, this is a radio communication system that. And uh, so if we got this uh, system, even just ourselves, would Barry City uh, or town be potentially uh, benefiting from it? Um, we would have to be very clear in this build out that it, you know, it's uh, Shouldn't, you know, you have to, I mean, how like, <laughs> <laughs> Barry City will benefit. Um, Barry City will benefit. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Because so, um, well, I guess my follow-up question is, um, I mean, it seems like simple math to me that if we're going to get the same infrastructure regardless, um, that spreading that uh, liability out over more towns works out, would work out better um, economically for us. So. Uh, I mean, if Barry City, Barry Town are going to benefit from it, why? Oh, I'm sorry. Right, right. Sorry, I shouldn't lump them in. But um, then, yeah, why? And and you know, to to have them involved would mean going through the authority at this point. Is that correct? It's 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 uh, it's what the, the authority is proposing as the right. proper vehicle to get there. So uh, it seems like that. I, I mean seems logical to me that it would overall be cheaper for us and to go that way. And let me give you an example. Um, a hundred, a million, I think we, did, we ran the example of like a million and a half bond, a 20-year amortization, like 4%. It, it translated into a payment stream of about $100,000 over the 20-year period. Spread out. It's either Montpelier does a loan, they have to figure out how we get that $100,000, or you spread it out. Using the similar type of funding formula, Montpelier's share in that formula was roughly 20 varies with roughly 20. And so that's the current formula. We haven't really even looked at that. That's kind of what we're proposing to do. See, how do we split up that risk liability to get something we all need? And by November, we'll have that answer. If they if they join us, we'll know more next week. You know, next week we have our meeting with Capital West where they've asked us to come in to discuss membership. Um, we'll know more next week. You know, unfortunately, this meeting's right before that. I wish I had more clarification on that. Um, I was very encouraged by Barry City's response yesterday, so they're still at the table. 
I'd hate to get down the road two, three, four years down the road, this thing is dissolved and we don't have the vehicle to actually do this and you don't have the momentum to do it. Um, it would be hard to recreate what we've done over the past couple of years. Um, but, I, you know, I'm obviously a lot of in this, so you, know, you can tell me how. What happens if Completely Barry doesn't base. approve the uh, proposed, Barry City approve the proposed appropriation? Well, it's a collective vote. It's not an individual city vote. Um, just add we the, add up the votes from Montpelier and the votes from Barry, both pro and against. One, and that's one, one, one. It's like Spalding vote for them, and they, they understand that. They might not be happy that they, <laughs> they, they, we, they've always passed it. We've always both passed it by significant margins. So we've never run up against that. Um, that may be a bigger issue. And uh, recently, this council resolved to uh, support exploration of regional public safety with the caveat that that was going to come out of Montpelier dispatch in terms of our participation there. Is there any update there? That the, that the standards for participation were to be determined by Montpelier dispatch. Mr. Cummings or someone else has been involved in making that happen or has decided that that's not in the interest of the city or has that proceeded at all? Supervisor, um, you know, overseeing our communications, which we're, uh, we're doing. So I'm not really clear on your question. Sure. Um, let me try to state it another way. I, I think I know what you're getting at. I think we do intend, as the authority, to help you know create policies and protocols. And using model on paper as a model is like is what we were proposing. And I don't think that has changed. Um, we haven't got that's that's I think a part of the process over the next six months. If I can just please add, I think along to along with that. Um, this past year, uh, we, we've been adding Active 911. It's an additional way to um, using technology to <coughs> accurately communicate location of fire calls, things like that. Um, we, we just had at a, the local emergency planning committee meeting last night at the hospital. Um, we did an after action review of exercising the Montpelier Police Department's continuity of operations plan. Uh, and part of that, and it's now, now, now to um, I was informed uh, almost uh, potentially eight to 11 fire departments are now have active now one. So as far as the regional, I mean, the energy as far as working collaboratively is definitely there. And that that was also Barry City. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was Deputy Chief Joe Altsworth that gave me that figure because I thought it was only five departments. That he was so in terms of our department always looking to improve even with what we do have for technology um, and also even something as simple as uh, my big push now that what I put up to to try to get out the fire chiefs is to have them all all of our client communities to sign up for for model alert um, and be like three three or four tier deep uh, things like that. So again, if we had to get a message out that we had to evacuate our police department or we lost our site and we had to relocate to Barry City, we can get those, those, that messaging out. So does that help answer what we are doing? I have no doubts that. You know, Montpelier Police Department is constantly improving and looking for ways to improve service. I guess my question was more focused on the role of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority as it connects to the Montpelier Police Department. And that, for me, has been a concern over the last couple of years. Is how do we get everybody to the table? And how do we get I this to move forward? It's, it's, a, it's been a concern of mine, obviously. Um, and it's been a, a you know, um, some things have been frustrating, some things have been great opportunities. It's like, as I can reflect back, is that there's, there's, we are, we are, even if nothing happened and this, this were to fail, let me say it before, we are so much further along because of the work that's been done by the CBPSA in terms of our, the bridge, for example, the interoperability that we're trying to establish between Barry City and, and, and here. Um, and, uh, and back to the, the meeting that, um, that, that Tom talked about. That far as you know that, that part where I walked out of a meeting excited about something that was it um, because it was clear uh, you know, there's we're, we're nervous because a lot of things at stake here um, I certainly don't want to be in the situation of a, a community that suddenly has a layoff of employees and is sitting on infrastructure they can't use um, or being in a community where you know public safety is at risk because we don't have absolute vital things that a community can that's kind of where we are now with this infrastructure. And that's where, um, you know, and, and you nailed it and you said, this is why you look at regionalization, because nobody can do this alone. Do you support this proposal? 
Uh, I have I have reservations still, um, but as far as the infrastructure part of it, I, I absolutely I, I can support that. Um, I am concerned about. Well, I guess what I'm talking issues. about is the proposed budget, the the well, essentially the budget request, and then the related planning that goes into that budget request with an outcome well, of what they There's proposed. a lot of there's you know if you if you didn't have any history and you read and you read the proposal that. Well received. It sounds like there's a lot of you know really good things in there. Sounding, like, I just don't know if about some of the deliverables. Quite frankly, I mean, you know, there's I, I don't. My barometer in terms of 273, you're not in my conversations with the commissioner. I, I don't see a lot of that necessarily happening at at least certainly out of this session. Um, so and, and I don't know what Capital West wants to do except I do know that they want to do it with us. So I think there's still some some discussion. So whether or not I mean, we you know, the budget you know, that budget uh, amount, uh, I'm gonna leave that one up to you. Uh, we're still working with Capital West. We still like I said earlier on, we still know we need a we need a partnership. Um, but I'm only looking at it that's very near sighted. That's just my failure in Capital West. I am still trying to get my head around the whole thing would look like and down the road, I do think we're all going to need one location, and that's going to be very pricey, and we all need to be in that together. Uh, just, I just wanted to follow up on it, the budget comments, which is just that I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the city manager um, has not um, recommended these funds as part of the budget process. Now, certainly, this council can add whatever we like to the budget, but I would assume that that recommendation was developed within the budget congress that city staff participated in. Well. Yes and no. Um, we only received the budget request, specific budget request after our budget was submitted. And so based on the, the last time the board was here, they told us in the meeting that this would not be a budget request. So that's the meeting. Now I did meet with the board in late December, and it became clear that they might have something coming but we didn't have it. So I think as soon as we received it, I passed it along and flagged it on January 3rd to you that we now have a new request for 28-2, and you asked to have them in this week. So that was last week, so that's that's why they're here. Um, I'll just say, so that everyone knows, um, when I met with the board, I told them at that time that we had zero in the budget and that uh, it seemed to me that uh, I couldn't predict what the Montpelier Council would do, but that um, I believe they had to have very clear deliverables, that people were getting tired of spending money um, without seeing results, that based on our conversations with our staff, Bob and Tony and, and with Bob and Donna, that the infrastructure was the thing that could benefit the city and the region the most because it would get, even whether we ever became a regional service or not, it still would allow everybody to communicate together, um, that we, we Again, synthesizing what I believe to be the case and being clear that I was speaking kind of for myself, that the city initially went into this with the idea that it was going to be four communities and it ended up only being two and that having broader membership would be an important goal, whether it was Capital Fire, whether they could get Barry Town back in or Berlin or somebody, that, that more participation would be a better thing. And that, again, speaking strictly for myself, that my... Our, our, our view on the regional dispatch was we like the idea, but we already run a, a very large regional dispatch system, and it runs pretty well. So until we see something that is an improvement financially or service-wise or both over what we're doing, um, we can see a reason to get successful. So what I would say is that um, you know, it's my first time hearing this, but the, the request at least I think is consistent with the message I gave them. A couple of questions. Um, but I don't know where, about the 28-2, where that comes from or what that means. I think just wondering um, whether we have some sort of steady state plan um, for public safety infrastructure in outlined already in our uh, so we have thinking. We have funding for facilities and we have funding for equipment um, in our, our, our plans. They're not specifically outlined, but they, there are some fairly large facilities, funds. Um, 
this would be something we would, you know, we'd have to overlay into that and work that into. Um, but it is, you know, again, as Tony said, a lot of the work that this group has done has been very helpful and it's crystallized the things we've just lived with that we just we were living with and understanding better the problems and the potential solutions as technology changes. I think, you know, whether there's ever a regional system or not, if we have somehow had a technological platform that Barry City, Barry Town, Berlin, everybody was on, public safety is going to improve. I'm not all the way sold that we're ready to merge systems just yet. I mean, operating systems, but um, and, and to the question is, do we need an authority to explore that or not? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, another question, uh, maybe Tom, for you. Um, I. I think I'm hearing that you met with Barry City mm -hmm. yesterday or recently and last night. last night you said they expressed interest. They didn't shoot us down. They didn't <laughs> shoot you down. <laughs> right. So and, and they you know, we had told them and I apologize, you know, the, the issue of not adding any funds in the budget and I explained it exactly as I tried to do now. It, it's like I don't want to come back to you in November after we've made progress, we have a bond proposal, we have it's a simulcast system presentation we made, and we wouldn't be able to see it through to the end of this year. Even if Montpelier takes over at that point, um, I just wanted to be able to front that we have funds through late October, November, based on our modeling. Um, and so to get us through similar level of funding by, so you had to go in a fiscal year for the next July, we'll need these amount of funds. And that's where the, the we took the 100000 from last year and we, uh, we, we backed out the 40 grand we figured we we split the 60. It wasn't anymore. That's how we came up with the Montpelier number. Well, my question really has to do with the, um, I understand about Capital West, and then we have Montpelier. So at the moment, it sounds as though we have three potential partners, all firmly planted in midair. And so I'm I'm sitting here wondering, and, and I'm, I actually would like you to succeed. I would like to see a regional public safety authority. I think that uh, our area can support it and would benefit from it. So that's that's my uh, inclination. At the same time, are we waiting for the first commitment? How? What? What is the timeline of commitments? And are we all waiting for somebody else to commit first, or how does this? How do P, how do municipalities and Capital West? make their commitment how does well, this happen well we have a meeting next week with their board our board and their board to discuss <coughs> terms basically of what they would feel are acceptable or not and so we'll know more after next week or maybe their subsequent follow-up meetings if there's further questions so it's going to happen i think relatively quickly it's going to be a no or no go on their part whether they just want to be a contracted member or not um you know i would have hoped to have that meeting earlier but just timeline could get everyone to the same table. Um, I think from there, you know, I believe dominoes will fall because as you prove success or as you build up a system, I think you'll prove the value and possibly um, you'll bring other towns in. But I don't think we have the capacity to bring other towns in until we've set this up. So will they wait to hear that Montpelier is is supportive or? Um, I'll give you a comment from How's December. That work? From December when we had our joint meeting. A comment that was made to us, which was frustrating in a way, because they said, "Well, we would have been forced to join if Montpelier had ceded authority." So our original quest, remember, was to cede authority, and, and it was frustrating to me at that point because we pulled back that because I felt that if you had that type of uh, event, it would force the, sort of the dominoes to fall, so people would view that this is this is the entity that they have to go towards. So when I heard that comment, I'm like, "Well." Ugh. Maybe a year ago, if I had phrased it a little bit differently, um, I think everyone's right there. I think it's a matter of building trust. I think it's a matter of building partnerships, having these uh, public discussions, both with councils as well as dispatchers, to get their opinion on <coughs> what the true system needs to be developed. Uh, I know Caroline's here, and, and she's been instrumental in helping us at our board level to bring in the dispatcher perspective and, and to see well what they, what do they need. And I think that's going to be tremendously valuable. Um, I think everyone wants the same thing. It's just it's hard to break down everyone's individual barriers, of, uh, and, and everyone. I think it just needs to be equitable and definable and explainable, and then we can make the roadshow amongst the different towns. 
But I think what Jean's also asking, would it help Capital Far Mutual Aid to have Montpelier say, yes, we support this? Oh, yes, this. yes, it would be tremendously helpful. Is that what you were asking? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it would be tremendously helpful. Because we're going to a meeting next week, and I think uh, a vote of support or not would, would, would steer them in what direction I think they would feel comfortable committing to or not. You know, a lukewarm, lukewarm non-committal versus a wholehearted support would, would be viewed differently, I think, in, in their deliberative process. And might that also impact Barry's decision as well, or are they waiting for Capital West, or? Barry City's in, and, okay. and they're, they're, they're not, they didn't vote us down, and they were supportive of our vote, okay. uh, and they're. Well, the council's, you've got the support for this budget proposal? For yeah, the we went last night. Council, yeah. For last night. Yeah, we had, they had, Great feedback. You know, one of the one of the points w with um, one of the council members, and I can, you know, Mike uh, Smith is a former council member from Barry. Um, you know, they're concerned about the Montpelier representation on the board. So it's this this territorial thing that we're trying to overcome, and so they want us to review the charter. And, and so we're trying to overcome all these barriers. But you know, they were supportive. And Does that include the support of the mayor? He did support it. Um, I, I was. I was pleasantly surprised with, with, uh, with <coughs> Tom's support, and, uh, you know, they didn't vote, but it was a consensus decision that uh, they understand what we're doing, they understand the deliverables, they understand the exit strategy. Other questions? So I, I thought I read this in here, but I couldn't find it a, a second time. You all did add a seat on your board for people from, um, from dispatch. Is that true? No. Oh, okay. No, Maybe I did no. not read that. They, they've been at our meetings, and, okay. and they've had a tremendous amount of input. But we haven't changed our charter to change any voting membership. You know. There was some conversation last night about dispatch having representation on the board. Yeah. And that's when I went in and, and, and said that you know originally this was a public safety committee looking at fire, police, dispatch, everything, and, and through all the roads we've taken, we've narrowed it down to we got to start with one and dispatch and. Um, you know, that was the question that was asked, and certainly if we're going to focus on dispatch, there's no reason why not to have some representation there. Um, whether we can do it as a board member or not, we'd have to look at the charter and see what, uh, that we certainly want that input um, without that. Just as a follow-up on membership, too, as you go to Capital West next week, uh, is it your intention to have some mechanism by which they will have representation on this board should they choose to become a partner? That's what we hope. We, we have hope. a mechanism. It's, the, charter has the, the charter has the mechanism, and we, we welcome their feedback. Uh, you know, part of the issue you get back to in terms of creating policies and protocols, some of the things we've heard is that we have the policies and protocols. It's getting consistent, you know, people following them in all of the towns in, in, in the same manner, and sometimes uh, dispatchers have a difficult time uh, in that. Um, I think having them at a seat at the table can address these concerns uh, very quickly and, and it'll be a very efficient manner. Okay. Could, uh, I just... I would like to address the dispatcher membership uh, question. Um, the membership of a dispatcher, as I recall, was intended to be on our dispatch executive committee. Uh, we, we, we have acknowledged that we have, over the course of our planning time, not done a sufficient job in embracing the uh, dispatching staff in this planning process. Uh, we have heard that loud and clear. We have all intentions of including, had all intentions of including the dispatchers in the uh, uh, executive, dispatch executive committee. But after our third proposal meeting with less than uh, satisfaction from the Montpelier staff, it became obvious that we are not moving forward with dispatching as it's currently planned. Uh, and the message was loud and clear that the only way to move dispatching forward needs to be in a single site facility which is at one of the cores of this budget process. That is going to involve a reconstituted planning process. And um, at least I can speak for myself, that has to, it has to include dispatches in order to uh, advance this at, at, in any way. Uh, Working through management and working uh, on my own to develop a planning process has failed. 
and uh, I, I, I need to say perhaps working by the board and on myself uh, alone it has failed perhaps less than management although I have tried to focus myself through management and uh, uh, that obviously has not worked. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering um, how we could decide whether we, we are going to offer support for their plan moving forward, something that they could take with them uh, to, to their meeting at Capitol West. Does it have to be a motion? Or well, if you we wanted to do that, you could make a motion, sure. Or I wouldn't support it, it, but that's just one voice. Uh, can it be a less can... formal vote, or should it be a motion? Well, I think the only way to, well, I, mean, I guess it's up to you. But mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think a, a motion would, or a vote would probably be the most appropriate. All yeah. right. So um, I, I'm, I move um, that we support the um, actions of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority to um, move ahead um, to create a partnership and um, and at this time would I also include the funding? Or is that a separate question? That would be the same. Would you, I mean, my, we yeah, have to place it on the it, I would include the request. I mean, as long as you're and, supporting and, it, and, well. and that we would in, uh, <coughs> agree to support their request for is it twenty eight thousand two hundred dollars? Is there a second? A second. Okay. Discussion. Uh, just well, Tom, you, you, earlier in this meeting, you gave us an option um, of either. Uh, to ask for the money now and, and give it back later if you don't need it or um, to succeed and then ask later and I guess uh, I'm more in the camp of uh, giving you another six eight months to fulfill your mission we've been working on this as you all know I've been working very hard for several years and hundreds of thousands of dollars later um, and I do feel like we are getting closer there are buds on this tree uh, whether they will flower or be pollinated or bear fruit I think still remains to be seen I have a great deal of confidence in our city manager's ability to find $28,200 in October from our general fund if, if that were in fact the case and we were able to bring this uh, back to future councils. Well, just to clarify, if we support this and it's approved by the voters, it's an additional item appropriated outside, this, outside of our budget. But we chose not to go that route as a board you know, because we didn't want to put a council in that position. You know, so we wanted the voters to hear our plan. and leave us with the flexibility that if they come back to us and say we don't approve it we write a check it'll be the easiest two checks we write to clear out our checkbook you guys hold our checkbook anyway so you know, Todd can probably just transfer it internally so I'd just like to articulate <laughs> why I um, why I don't support this I I was a very strong supporter of the regionalization proposal I strongly supported as you recalled uh, Tom when you were on the City Council uh, the creation of public service authority, the uh, involvement of the city of Montpelier, that was, I don't know how many years ago, and you know, it was uh, three years ago, uh, several hundred thousand dollars uh, later uh, ago. And the goal of that uh, at the outset was clearly to make create more efficient services. It was to, uh, and I know there may be some disagreement about that now, but in, in hindsight, but at the time, and I very clearly remember this, the goal was to create uh, cost savings by providing more efficient delivery of services by having better, more, uh, um, greater um, you know, capacity that, uh, than we have now. Um, and I appreciate the effort. It just feels to me like we, we have created this authority and now it continues to look for a, a purpose. And so we found this flaw in the dispatch system and so that becomes the raison d'etre of the, of the public safety authority as opposed to a broader regionalization with multiple towns that was originally the vision that was uh, that we that we thought we were creating and I feel like now we're chasing a purpose rather than having the purpose drive the authority and I don't really well, let me just think that. let me let me just finish and then I'll turn it over to you if you like um, this may work I just think at some point we have to say enough's enough and we've spent my pillar well over a hundred thousand dollars I don't think we're going to recoup that that money and I think that what you're proposing it sounds to me it's something that we could do internally and do it uh, do it well. I don't think we need another layer of bureaucracy to accomplish what you've highlighted is a is a problem, and that, I'm sure that's a benefit that you all have, are, have, have 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 recognized that, brought attention to a problem. But I suspect, well, I don't you know, whether it would have come to the attention of the city or not. I assume it would have, uh, but I think it's one that the city 
within the partnership with these other organizations could address uh, more efficiently without creating another level of bureaucracy and another level of funding. That, and I just don't see that we will ever get the returns that we were expected at the outset, at least when I supported this. So that's why I don't uh, support the continued funding uh, that's been proposed. I, I appreciate it. I just want to make a couple comments. One, I think public safety is the number one uh, funding priority of any city in, in, in Vermont. And that, I may differ from people's opinions, but I think it's the core function of any city government. Um, and, and so because of that, I feel this is vitally important. Two, this issue didn't find us. This came about through discussions with dispatchers, board members, city council members, city managers, police chiefs, fire chiefs, uh, <coughs> the people who are actually doing the business. So it didn't find us. This is how it's evolved. You know, we, we've presented different ways we felt we could make a positive impact. This is the latest iteration that we think we have a meaningful chance. Third, we're offering an exit strategy that we know regionalization is difficult. We also know that there needs to be some time commitment uh, and commitment from outside communities or there's some time or, or it's not going to happen at that time. Um, and we've offered that through this budget process. So, I, so I, I appreciate your, you know, I, I, I think regionalization is the answer for a lot of different things. This being, I think, one of the most important. And so with that, um, thank you. Okay, any other comments, Ann? Uh, so I just want to express that I um, really appreciate, Paco, that, uh, you know, in moving forward, you would be including, uh, you know, voices of, of dispatchers um, as a, a part of the process. That's um, really important to me. Um, uh, and and in addition, I mean, with um, this bill that may uh, end up increase, increasing um, the fee for what is otherwise, uh, you know, a free service right now might position this group really well to, uh, to t you know, take up uh, people who are sort of abandoning, um, you know, the what, what used to be a free service but won't be. <laughs> um, so we may be able to pick up some more. Um, customers, um, you know, after the session, if everything goes really well, um, so we'll see. I mean, um, I also feel like this is the uh, what's the right expression? Uh, the Fisher Cut Bait Year, um, and so you know, I'm I'm willing to uh, uh, you know s support this, um, and if it works, great. If if not, I mean, uh, we've certainly learned a lot. Anyone else? Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Uh, the ayes have it. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the, appreciate the time. So let's see, we have uh, three more items. Budget discussion, workshop on TIP, which we're going to do last, and then well, an appointment, and then a discussion uh, imminent domain right. findings. Thank so why don't we do the uh, budget discussion next. Oh, yeah, sure. All right, we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll be back. Discussion about the budget. Before moving to the other items, uh, Bill, did you just want to run through the list of so things that you had, and then anybody who has others could add to it? So last, the last week when we had our budget discussion, um, we, there were only a couple items flagged. We tried to get you as much information as we could. One was the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, and we're just taking a vote on that. Um, there was a question just. I think more informational about the inf special events costs, and we tried to break that out as best we could and get that to you. Question of whether Airbnb revenue was tracked by community, the answer was no. Uh, question about council pay, and I sent you out some information about that. Uh, GMT has sent us some information today. They will be here at our next meeting. Um, so they have, uh, anyway, you guys got their letter. We can talk about that if you'd like. And there was a cost question about uh, if we were, wanted to do ordinance review and what did we decide was it 8,000 we thought it was? 7 to 8,000. It was probably what sufficient to do the bulk of what we'd like to do for this coming year. Um, so those were the, the notes I had as pending issues. From last week. 
Can you give us a top line if we were to do all of those things, what it would add to the um, Well, so <coughs> about half so, a cent. So we, well, if it was 8000 for the ordinances, depending on what you decided on council pay, I can't remember what the options were right off without looking at my sheet. So with those two items say that was twelve thousand or thirteen thousand. Then right. and then adding C D P S A. P S A. So forty. So that's half a cent. 80, so about eighty-seven thousand dollars is one cent on the tax rate. And then in percentage terms, we were at about two percent before. Are we to be at two point five? Or yeah, yeah. It's just the, the cents and percents run pretty close. So if we were at one point nine, we're at two cents, one point nine percent. So we'd be at. Point five cents, probably two point four percent. Okay, why don't we take this one at a time? Um, council pay. Did somebody have a proposal they want to make or discussion? Or where do you want to go with that? So, uh, uh, well, Donna, you sent an, an email um, out about this. That I'm speaking for you now. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, your email had said that uh, you were thinking of increasing it to 2000 for the council and 4000 for the mayor. Oh, that one. Okay, yes. <laughs> I couldn't remember what I said. I did send an email in response to Bill that I thought it was 2000 to 5 didn't seem as balanced to me as 2000 to 4. But that was just... That sounds fine to me. <laughs> so in total, we're... Is that a I, what's the motion? Ad? I can so certainly the make a motion. We'd be raising city council's annual stipend <laughs> pay to two thousand dollars and the mayor's to four thousand. And that that would be a five thousand eight hundred dollar budget increase. So you want to make that a motion? I, I make John Odom, did you take that as a motion? Uh, I I tried to yeah, present like, it as such. I was prepared for it to be a Is there a motion? How about that? Yeah. <laughs> I would like to make the motion that we increase city <laughs> council's pay up to $2,000 and the city ma um, mayor to 4000 Is there a second? A second that. Is there a discussion? Um, Justin? Well, this council just a few minutes ago uh, decided to spend over $28,000 in additional money outside the city manager's recommendation to uh, contain the tax rate uh, to around that of inflation. Uh, this is particularly important to me because, as many of you know, there is a significant portion of the residents in Montpelier are seniors living on fixed incomes. While that has gone up a little bit this year, the Medicaid reimbursement has gone down, effectively uh, eating up much of that increase. And so uh, as we weigh uh, increasing uh, the burden of taxation on our residents, uh, I think giving ourselves a pay raise may be something um, to consider, and I can certainly appreciate the equity issues, um, but I can't support it at this point because we've already gone over what I thought we had agreed as a target, and I understand that's the, certainly the privilege. So one of the main things this council and all councils do is spend other people's money, um, but to do it to give myself a raise, I can't support. Any other comments? I would just observe that you're not giving yourself specifically a raise. Thank you. Um, I appreciate Justin's comments, um, but I do think that there is a matter of equity in terms of who gets to participate in the decision-making process. And in the short term, by um, shortchanging, not shortchanging, but by, by underpaying the council in order to save the taxpayers' money, which is my initial impulse, um, but by doing that over a long period of time, we've decreased um, the value that we put in serving on city council and um, decreased the ability of lower income residents to participate. Um, and folks really do have to decide, you know, can I afford to spend an extra five, ten hours a week on this? Um, and I will say that I, I spend a lot of time reading, I spend a lot of time um, at both these meetings and at um, uh, our subcommittee meetings, um, and I don't think that's an overestimate of how much time it takes. And in order for somebody to make that commitment and really be here and be present and be able to make that decision, those those really important decisions, um, 
they need to have the financial ability to do that. Um, and I don't know that we can fix that just by going up 800 bucks, um, but I think that we can try and move in that direction um, to make it more possible for folks of more diverse economic backgrounds to serve on the council. Any further discussion? Just ask a clarifying question. Um, I should have asked this too, because I should have asked the same question about the CVPSA motion, and I didn't. Um, it, it, this motion is to is addressing the wording that you will then put on the ballot, right? Because it's it's worded as though you're assessing that money now, and the so CVPSA kind of was too. It didn't reference the ballot or anything. So I mean, I can make that inference and make some adjustments, but I just wanted to be sure. Well, and we'll be approving the ballot at the next meeting anyway, so they'll have their chance to do that. But the CVPSA charter actually calls for it to be ballot items, so the council can't. You don't do that wording. We'll send you the wording. And the no, I just mean in terms of the wording of the. Uh, of the two motions that were made, right. I'm like, eh, this. If wanted to make sure, <laughs> the council pay is on the ballot as separate items. Right. We've always accounted for that amount of money in the budget as well, mm -hmm. so we would put it in as though it had passed. Okay. I don't know what happens if, if I assume if they don't pass, then it's zero. But I don't, well, no, I won't worry about no the wording then, as long as it's clear and it's consistent. I'm just going to put it as it is. Keep my hands off. Just checking. <laughs> So, so, but on the ballot, it says approve this much amount for counselors and this much amount for the mayor, mm -hmm. and that's the amount I was stating, what I would expect to see on the ballot. Well, right, just that okay. the motion was simply move to pay $2,000 for counselors and right. mayor to 4000 Right. period. So that's why I was checking. And so once the pay went up, I'm assuming they would then be put on the ballot that way. Well, you'd put it on the ballot, right. You'd put it on the ballot if it passed. So yes, that's what it would be. Okay. But we would put it in our budget to us, assuming that it was going to pass, so we'd accounted for it in projected tax rates. We usually show people the effective ballot yeah. items on. Okay. I think, uh, and again, I'm just going to come back to this. I feel like this is something that people should vote on. And I, and I don't think that this is the council saying we're taking a pay raise from anybody. I mean, this is us saying, you know, and I think Rosie's point is is poignant because as someone who has not necessarily been in a financial position to always have the option of doing something like this, which is probably one of the most important things that I do with my time, I mean, you know, time translates to money for a lot of people in our community, and I think that it's important that we're cognizant of that, that, that all of us right now are in a position where we can give up that time from other things that generate you know, a, a livelihood for us to be here. And I think it's important that our constituents hear this conversation. And I think that it's important that they, you know, that, that they have the ability to vote on that. And if they say no, that's fine. You know, I still have the, frankly, the luxury of being able to show up because I'm in a place in my life where I can. But I also want to know, I want my community to know that I support everyone having the option of standing up and saying, yeah, I want to serve my community, and now I feel like I'm in a place where I can because I'm going to have enough to pay, you know, for for someone to come in and, and sort of pick up the slack where I can't right now because I am serving in such an important role in my city. I'd just like to express my gratitude for um, the training line items and also the copying line items that historically have been part of the city council's budget. I know that that budget is proposed to shrink significantly, but I hope that a future council see fit to leave those in place for me. Making those copies was an expense that I really appreciated the city bearing the burden of and that those other supporting line items within the city council's budget besides just compensation that to me were very valuable as well. Anyone else? Hearing none, all in favor please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, uh, GMTA. Um, Received a memo today. I just, uh, I think, I just want to make note of the, the frustration that I had about this process was that I and Bill and I have talked about this um, back in November. Uh, was concerned about having seen the ridership numbers that this really was not a viable, but it didn't look to me to be. I raised a lot of concerns about whether this was an appropriate place for us to put our money. So we. Asked for certain information about ridership, cost for riders, then wanted to meet with them. Just hadn't gotten anything, and then we see that we're scheduled to meet with them in the night we approve our budget. So I felt like we were being put in a box. So Bill and I have talked about that. The result was we got a, did get a response from them, a memo, and I think they are taking those concerns to heart. They, maybe they were pursuing them anyway, um, but uh, we do have 
a proposal here. It sounds like they're going to uh, propose a reworking of this uh, route in response to the ridership. And I just want to say I'm very supportive of, this, of GMTA. I just don't want us to put money where it's just where it's not effective. We want us to put it for it to put, spend money on mass transit. I want it to be used in a way that's promoting mass transit. And it looks like they're responding to that. So I'm I'm satisfied with my concerns. Rosie. Oh. Do you have a sense? Are they asking for forty thousand dollars, or do we put that in there, in there as a placeholder? Well, the, that's what it has been. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for their agency. I would not be surprised if they came in with a revision, if they rework this, and particularly if they do it with the capital shuttle because that's funded by the state. Um, I think one option might be they come in and ask for less money with a reworked route. Uh, they will be here at the next meeting. Okay. They're aware, you know, they were here actually physically here the night we finished the zoning, and after two or three hours, we finally decided to let them go. And I think they were planning to talk about that. And we had hoped to have them last week, couldn't make it. Hope to have them tonight. They can't, but they are here. So it's unfortunate the timing, but uh, you know, I've had a couple of conversations with Mark Souza, their their general manager, and I think they get it. And you know, they don't want to support un, you know low performing routes either. So. So the forty thousand was based on prior appropriation, so that's what. So we'll know more on the twenty fourth we'll about whether that's the, the actual number there. I think. In general, I just want to say that um, I've been following along on their next gen planning process, and I'm really impressed by how in depth they've gone, and they're really um, all the routes. Um, they've really been trying to figure out how to make this work better, and I really appreciate that that process that they're going um, through. So I think I'm, I look forward to hearing more from them, but it's a an interesting process. I'm curious in those discussions, are they considering autonomous vehicles much in that plan? As you, many of you know, this week was the Las Vegas uh, Consumer Electronics Show, and several major motor manufacturers have unveiled autonomous vehicles. So there are some significant players working on solving this challenge sooner rather than later. And I am, for one, I'm very interested in um, starting to set some amount of money aside in anticipation of the reality that this technology will be coming forward perhaps sooner than we expected. Um, if we have, I'll just speak anecdotally, many times when I see these rather large, uh, heavy fuel consuming vehicles traveling our streets, uh, they're not full. Uh, and I know that they provide capabilities for disabled or other people that perhaps a smaller vehicle may not. Um, but in the uh, suite of options uh, that we may explore to get people from A to B, I certainly hope that uh, autonomous vehicles are one of the things that we're thinking about and considering in the not too distant future. I can just say from having read their materials, um, I didn't see anything on that, but I did see that they were looking at shifting um, some of their um, <coughs> ADA um, and medical uh, rides more to a demand response like individual vehicles rather than relying on the buses for those. I think that was part of it, observing that. Can't, again, can't speak for them, but having read the publicly available materials. That makes a lot of sense. If you've got, you know, often one rider, I think their numbers show virtually one rider on a bus at a time, it's going to be a lot cheaper to send a smaller vehicle and do it at a, I don't know, and basis. better service. And a lot, for and a lot more convenient yeah. to the re users. Ashley? I would just like to highlight that, you know, I don't have to rely on public transportation living in Vermont, but I've lived in other areas where that was my option. and. I think for a lot of folks, that's the only option, and and I I would hate to think that as a council we were willing to send a message that uh, we are not invested in making sure that everyone has access to employment, to medical care, to um, grocery shopping. I mean, some of these are basic necessities that these services provide. And while I realize that maybe the numbers aren't what we would want to see or what we had hoped to see, that this is a, a significant function that city government performs in in providing access to life-saving services to people and, um, and and I think as a, as a council member it's incumbent upon me to point out that while we might not need to rely on that there are folks who live in our districts that do and and I think that we need to send a, a clear commitment to ensuring that those folks still have access to reliable safe transportation that gets them to their necessary um, and, and sometimes even fun appointments and, and I think that that's a part of what we perform as a function as a council because it's a good point because the circulator is not a density like your commuter bus going by or even the capital shuttle it's for those it is a demand response so you have a base route but you go off the route and it is for people who don't have other options for whatever reason 
And we made that commitment, to, I think, to our citizens who don't have access to our roads any other way. And we've even made it no fee to encourage that. So to feel that we're, we're now paying at $40,000 is just 20% match of the federal and state money that supports that route. It doesn't cover that route. And at that rate, with just even 18,000 people, that's $2.22 a ride that we supplement. It's so small. We do much more than that on the road to every car driver. So I really hope we keep a balanced picture. People never quite understand what the car costs them because it's there. You pay your insurance, you pay your gas, and you drive. So when you translate that to a bus, I think we sometimes forget. That's all. Just keep an open mind. I would just say, I mean, uh, keep an open the co mind. cost, and I'm fully, I totally agree with you about the, uh, both the, the need to support low-income individuals who need transportation options, but also public transit generally. But I think we have to do it in a cost-effective way. I mean, if you're talking about $10 a ride, no one it's of us would $10 even. A ride. Well, it is the gross cost on the memo. It's the gross cost for boarding ten dollars and seventy nine cents. Now that's not our cost, but I don't think we can just yeah, look solely at our it our cost. Uh, you know, that's the subsidized cost is two dollars and nineteen cents. Oh, for demand um, route, that's cheap. So, ten dollars a, a rider. I mean, that's just none of us would ever consider spending ten dollars to get in the car and drive somewhere. I mean, that's a, just a, a very high. I, the point I'm making, I think they're doing, they're getting it, is we need to be cost effective in how we deliver services. That, that's all I'm asking. We're not just right. We can't just, we've, we've spent 40000 a year. Let's just continue to do it regardless of whether people use it. And people don't. And that's the unfortunate problem. People don't use this service on, on any kind of significant basis. It's 70 rides a day. Where, where are you going to, what's going to happen to those rides, John? Well, I think that's what GMT's working on. I think we're going to hear what their proposal is. Just to be clear on my position, I was not suggesting that we cut funding this year. I was trying to draw attention to the fact that there are new options available. Now, there is no autonomous car today. I've used the bus to get to medical appointments myself. I can certainly appreciate how helpful that was. I'm encouraging us to think beyond what we have today because we look at this every year and we put money towards it because it is a worthy cause. My point is, how can we get those people where they want to go better? And uh, so I'm also very excited about autonomous vehicles. That'll be a great day. Um, separate from that, though, just in thinking about how to creatively consider, uh, you know, getting ridership up. There's going to be a, a working group um, of people from the school. Uh, and I believe also GMTA yes, uh, to yes. to talk about because right now there are no there's not buses that go to the high school or to the middle school and so thinking about how we can uh, use that service um, you know for specifically for kids or, or p potentially design some of the routes so that they're convenient for kids to take uh, I think will be very exciting so I'm uh, I'm a part of that group and if anyone else would like to join us. <laughs> I'm wondering if the if if the city is talking with these folks about um, construction plans for next year and we, that's also one of the things we're talking about. Part part of what they're working on. Okay, that'll be more riders, probably. Depends where we can find a place to park them. <laughs> that's the challenge right now. Okay, well, this isn't anything we need to take action on. So, is there any other comments? Taking it up again and. Two weeks, I think. Yeah, they'll be here for the 24th. Okay, what are the really last one was uh, ordinance revisions? I got, that may have, I don't know that, that, that was, was that, that was me, yeah. I don't know what that is. Uh, so, just thinking about next year's uh, goals, something that we've talked about uh, is that our ordinances could use some overhauling and some aligning with reality perhaps and also uh, you know incorporating restorative justice practices and enforceability etc uh, so we did not pick that up for the goals for this year so in thinking about that we may want to do that for next year we may want to uh, anticipate putting in the to the budget a uh, sufficient amount of uh, legal fees to support that work because that's going to be uh, a, where potentially a lot of the lift will need to happen what, legally. Again, what, are the goal, what are the 
things you're hoping to see? Well, so this is an idea that um, a lot of our ordinances say things that we don't actually enforce. Um, and they're, you know, we've, we've heard from a number of different folks um, within staff, and then, you know, all of us have noticed things as well where um, our practice isn't quite in line with what our rules say. And so I would like, and I think Ann would like, and others were, were um, agreeable to next year, um, perhaps instead of having, you know, a whole bunch of projects that we want to focus on, um, that our big overarching goal for next year, you know, contingent on the new member to join us, of course, um, would be that we would do an in-depth look at all those ordinances and all those policies and make sure that um, we kind of narrow it down to what we actually want to <laughs> to prohibit and allow and encourage and, and um, that our policies say what we, we do. So that was the idea. And that if we're going to do that, we probably need to have a little funding to, to support that process. I'm curious, how, roughly how many ordinances do we have currently? No, it's a big fat book. Thousands? <laughs> thousands fat tens book. of thousands? Oh, not tens of thousands. No, <laughs> probably hundreds. Hundreds. I, I assume that part of that budget line is for a lawyer to review. So I, this is like a perennial complaint of mine as a resident here in Montpelier. I'm really curious, and this is, I realize, maybe not the best time, but and I have asked about this before just to community members, I'm really curious about how much we spend on legal fees and whether or not um, that is something that we need to look at bringing in-house. I know, you know, I know we're a small city, but we seem to rely a lot on, um, you know, retained counsel for opinions, and that is not cheap. I'm a lawyer. I know how much I don't make in civil service and how much the <laughs> private sector does. And, and I think it's a very important function, and I just... You know, I, I, I struggle sometimes with the notion that, you know, we get these long memos back because I know how many hours those take. I mean, I've done that research and I, and I have, you know, written those memos. And, uh, and I just, I, I want to sort of keep that on people's minds, you know, if we're going to do all this work, which I think is really important work, um, you know, the, the legal costs associated with that, it, it might make sense to start, you know, to start thinking about bringing that in-house seriously. Just on that point, do you have those budget numbers available, or maybe you get them to us? Like what yeah. we, I have it. I'd be interested year to date what we spent on attorneys and then what book. we budgeted. Or I'm sorry, I mean, probably. Yeah, yeah, I think year to date don't um, hold me to this, but I, I, the last I glanced at it, we were in like the twelve thousand dollar range. So this year has not been a big. Oh, that seems like incredibly low. That's yeah, that's our, incredible. Well, the our, uh, for our budget for the year has been between forty and fifty-five between last year and this year. Way more than that. Historically. Proposed for next in prior year is years, because of 000. personnel issues and other contentious issues, we were well over 100,000. Adopted yes. for 2018 was 55,000. Yep. So and that's um, general fund. We also have some in the water and sewer fund. But but right, for Berlin. Yeah, it's not a huge number. Well, it's we're tracking well. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Let's keep up the good behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our thought with this is that some of this work will be done with an intern and then, you know, in house, and then we would send it just for review, not have a lawyer yes, drafting yes. everything that's... Mm -hmm. It just strikes me that, that, that I, to me, that's a function of city government, and and rather than paying a private attorney who's billing at whatever their rate is, it's usually over a couple hundred dollars, I mean, it just seems like something we as a city should should really look at and sort of see, you know, what the going rate would be to bring it in-house, you know, what a salary would look like, and I know it would be adding a city employee position, which you know, which there is certainly a cost associated with, but it just strikes me that it's something that if that's what, you know, if that's what we as a city are spending on legal advice, maybe it is something that we need to, to really think about bringing back to the city. One of the struggles that we've had uh, with, with legal opinions is the level of expertise yeah, within any one office or within any one attorney. Um, and I think, at least in my time here, we've gone to a number of different folks. I, so I don't know if there's one one person or even one office that could fulfill the, the variety of questions. The great thing about lawyers is they have networks. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, and that's certainly a, co a conversation we could have. I could probably, I don't know if we're going to solve that one tonight. No, and I'm not, I'm not saying year. that no, it needs to be solved now, but I really, I feel pretty strongly that if, you know, if we're relying on lawyers' opinions for things, which we should be, that's prudent to do, you know, and, and we're spending, you know, if we budgeted $55,000, not saying that that would be enough to compensate a city attorney's salary, but I, I think it's an important question to ask. Yep. 
I just want to add that I would really be interested in seeing those numbers. So, Bill. I think it's a great point you're making historically, uh, financially. I think it's a very strong case to be made in terms of um, historically. Double we, entendre there. We exceed <laughs> uh, the 40 or 50 or the small increases that we put into our legal budgets. Uh, I'm glad to see there's a correction this year, whether it's long term or not, I have no idea. I certainly, even in this budget cycle, if we're currently allocating 42,000 for legal fees, I don't know, no problem earmarking 8,000 or whatever the number was, le 42 less 8, uh, with the intention of exploring um, ordinance. Makes, seems to make sense that if it could be saved in uh, lawsuits, then uh, we could use it somewhere else. We have a carrying over a balance, significant balance from this year. All right, so the question is whether there's support for adding a new motion to add this funding into an additional. Well, I just, I guess I want to, I want to ask then, Bill, do you think that this is something that we could just use the fund balance left over from this year's savings to do rather than having to add it? It's possible. To the budget yeah, it's not. It's not a huge amount, and if it's a you know becomes a council priority, we'd make it work. <coughs> As I said, we, our thought was a lot of the sort of grunt work, so to speak, would be done by we'd hire an intern over the mm -hmm. summer and do that at you know a lower rate of pay, and then only have the final results reviewed and our, our actually we planned it out um, having the league of cities and towns do it in their hourly rate is a lot cheaper than most of the private practice. Mm -hmm. It's more like ninety-two dollars an hour. It's still not cheap, but it's cheaper than a private firm. So. And I, I think there is a tremendous amount of work that can be handled in house. Mm -hmm. um, just silly things like fee we reference, specific fees that, that may be in some of Yeah, so I think one staff it takes a first crack at actually updating everything and then by the time legal looked at it, we'd have a pretty solid document. Well, and I should add that it's really my intention personally to, like, for me personally, this is my priority for next year and I don't intend to be making lots of other asks of staff. Um, so I'm hopeful that that might generate like you're some. chairing the committee. <laughs> <laughs> Is that with this one? So uh, is, is your thought then to take the leftover, um, which is going to effectively be reserve money yeah. uh, or, for next or year? Or you take it out of current, you know, the budget and legal funds. And if you're comfortable with doing that, Bill, I guess I would. That's fine with me. I just wanted to raise it as an uh, up, upcoming issue. So. Okay. Uh, any others on our budget list? All right. Terrific. Uh, I think we said one other two items before we and just as a wrap up you've added 34,000 tonight between the, the council pay and the 28,000 you know conceivably if the if the GMT gets reduced next week it could be that net could drop wouldn't expect that well I don't know what they're going to propose I know but don't you seem to promise it. I wouldn't expect it. <laughs> I just said conceivably. Well it's based on a con I mean this isn't he's not making this up that well I talked to him too I just wouldn't it's great if it happened so we'll here, what we here, I guess. Where um, are we? Okay. Just yep. At thirty-four thousand, where are we at? And, or I guess you can send it to us after. Yeah. Calculate it out okay. We can or crunch it out while we're having the next conversation. Okay. Next item is to uh, uh, make an appointment to the ADA advisory committee. <coughs> we appoint Tina Wood to the ADA advisory committee. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second. Favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. And thank her. If you're watching Tina Wood. Thank you for your service on that. Sounds like you're eminently qualified for that, and we appreciate that important committee. Uh, next item is to approve the findings of fact, conclusions of law, and order regarding eminent domain of the Cumming Street property. You've, um, so the council uh, met, uh, had a site visit on December 6, 2017 of a property on uh, Cumming Street. It's necessary. The city had proposed uh, a necessity of a taking of a small amount of property to allow for a bridge replacement on that road, which provides access to the Cumming Street apartments. City had a site visit and then uh, held a hearing that night. Uh, we met in the executive session a week ago and um, reached a tentative agreement at that time on a proposed order. I've circulated that order. Uh, didn't hear back of any changes beyond what I tracked based on the conversation we had last week. So with that, do we have a motion to approve this uh, proposed order? So moved. Is there a second? second? All in favor, please say, I'm sorry. The discussion. I think uh, Councillor Turcott wanted to. Um, I do have something to say, which, uh, you know, anytime um, that a body considers seizing personal property 
I think this is a very, very important matter. Uh, our founding fathers knew this in the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, read very briefly from that. Sure, of course. Um, that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, and papers and effects against unreasonable search and seizures. I think there was agreement uh, amongst this body that there was a necessity in repairing this bridge. There are a whole bunch of people that live on the other side of it, and the state saw that it was uh, in very ill repair and needed to be replaced. What was less clear uh, was the value of the yard, which included absolute water frontage, mature trees, uh, and someone's lawn. Um, while this council uh, did reach a decision on compensation, my advice uh, to any residents who are faced with eminent seizure of their personal property in the future is that you consult with and retain an attorney uh, to be sure that your interests are well represented. Thank you, Justin. Are there any other comments? Yes, yes. I'd just like to highlight that it's actually the Fifth Amendment that deals with eminent domain and, and takings uh, for public purposes. Uh, the Fourth Amendment deals generally with constitutional law regarding the issue of warrants for criminal proceedings, but the Fifth Amendment, and I, and I agree with Councillor Turcott that this is a significant issue, and, um, and I think that the Council <clears throat> deliberated this in a thoughtful, meaningful way, and I understand that um, potentially the outcome is not what um, some may have hoped, but that I think that um, I think that this project is significant and important uh, to our city. Is there any other discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Um, we're going to do, because we're going to do part of our discussion with you folks on TIF and executive session, we're going to wrap up everything else. We'll just take, I think, a couple of minutes. Um, do council reports, Donna? Pass. Pass. Uh, I just want to thank the residents for their patience in the snow removal over the last couple weeks. Um, the city has many veteran staff that have been through dozens and dozens of winters, uh, but Mother Nature still has a few tricks up her sleeves, but uh, people need not worry. Uh, DPW does as well. So thank you for being patient. Rosie. I'll pass. Uh, uh, John and I were both at the rink opening today. It was delightful, uh, as well as uh, Governor Scott. And uh, yeah, so go check out the rink on the State House lawn. Pass. Okay, I guess I'm all set. To, uh, you know, I, do you all want to know what money, since you were talking about money and taxes and ballots, what's circulating? What do you mean? Oh, in terms as far of as yes. <laughs> yeah, petitions. Yeah, it would be useful to know. We did, as Bill was running through all those, I realized that doesn't. We got a pretty significant amount hanging out there. I'm yeah, guess. I mean, I, I hesitate to, to bring it up because I don't want to be a bummer on, on your all's discussion. <laughs> but I thought maybe I should mention it. There's yeah. the only thing that I know of that's that's money. There's a there's a one petition going around with three asks on it. Um, and just so you all know, they approached me and asked if that was okay. Um, I didn't think it was, but apparently the law says yes, it is. I don't, I don't like it at all, just out of, out of principle. I mean, I can imagine this ballot with a bunch of, it just it seems rife for fraud or manipulation, but it is the law. So the three that are out there are uh, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice is looking for twenty thousand, uh, Good Samaritan Haven four thousand, and People's Health and Wellness Clinic two thousand. So I haven't heard of any others, so I don't think there are any others. So. Thank you for that. And I guess I would just say, you know, we had this long discussion. I think this is an issue that the next council really needs to address because what we've done is created this fund that was based on a certain amount, and now we have this significant amount going off ballot, and it's increasing it by, you know, 30 percent uh, beyond what we used to spend. So it just, I think it doesn't really work, and we haven't figured that out. But I hope the next council does figure out some way to sync up these two processes because they don't work together now. Uh, Bill. Uh, the only thing I have is uh, meeting start times. Um, I guess a suggestion or question would be the next meeting, you know, we've got a fair amount on um, the last budget hearings and uh, GMD and all that. It's just six, but do people want to go back to 6.30 after that? The two February meetings? Yeah. Is the next meeting the 17th or 24th? 24th. <laughs> six thirty. It works a lot better for me. It's just hard to. This is our assumption. We moved it up to six because of zoning, and then we kind of rolled right into budget. But it seems like I would like that. Six thirty. 
starting March. Yeah, that's fine. Starting February. Starting February. Okay, that was it. That's all I have. Six thirty starts in February twenty fourth. Not next week. Oh, Not next okay. week. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. I keep saying next week, but I don't. Mean I'm sorry. It. However, next week the sprinkler meet committee is meeting at four thirty on the seventeenth. <laughs> That's true. Good heavens. We're making good use of our Wednesday. Is that it? You're all set? Okay. Okay. So we'll move to uh, the uh, workshop on the TIF program. So while they're setting up, I just. Provide guidance uh, about where we're going. <coughs> Understand, and uh, and because some of this involves some private properties, you'll be asked. You know, we'll do a public portion, and then at some point we'll need to do some of it in, in executive session. And I don't think, uh, you know, obviously we choose for us to continue uh, phase two of the grant. We'll do that in public session, but uh, or we can do that at the next meeting, whichever you prefer. That's it. And these three are going to lead us through that. And I think there is a presentation piece. Did anyone ever bring their jammies to Welcome, this Welcome, Bo. <laughs> oh, man, on? this is early. We're just getting this is early. Okay. Uh, I'm awake. <laughs> um, this is early, yeah. Yeah, you guys deserve a raise. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> we, will, um, we will have a PowerPoint up shortly for you, but um, just to start out, um, we are from White and Burke, um, Scale Henderson King, and I'm Stephanie Healy. You guys saw us back in um, July, I believe, approving the first phase of the work we were going to do for you on the TIF district. So tonight we're going to, um, if I can just pull this up, we'll, go, we'll walk you through several, um, the kind of big picture findings of phase one. We started in phase one of our, of our work and then um, we're prepared to talk about phase two and the, the, the goal is to move forward to phase two um, whether that happens at tonight's meeting or in two weeks we have a slot I think reserved in two weeks in case um, we don't get through it all if you want more time to digest or ask questions and we need to come back and answer them um, we, we built that time into the uh, into the timeline a little bit um, so I guess Again, I want to emphasize, and the materials were pretty thorough. Sorry, they were long. As you I heard you say, like, take me 10 hours to read them. I'm like, I hope they weren't all on ours. I'm sorry. But to give you enough, I mean, we haven't seen you in six months, and we wanted to give you a thorough update on everything we've been working on. And so um, what I want to emphasize is that tonight's discussion is really not about, and, and even the next step, which is going to phase two, is not about any major projects. It's not about making any decisions for any particular project, private infrastructure or <coughs> approving any public, or uh, pr public infrastructure or approving any private project. It's really process oriented. This is moving the, the ball down the field in the process of uh, establishing a TIF district. So tonight we're going to go through um, a quick recap of what is TIF because sometimes it gets stale, it's nuanced, it's worth just reiterating. Um, oh, good. Seriously, jammy time. All right. Um, <laughs> so I'm speaking, so I'll just be watching you. Just keep awake. Um, and then we'll talk about what we did, what phase one included, what the, uh, what our purpose was to find viability. What, what did we look for in order to determine whether or not there is viability here for a district? What were our findings? And then some of the questions that we see and we've seen in other districts that the council and the legislative body needs to make, needs to answer for themselves in order to move on to the next step. And then what is phase two and next critical steps? Now a lot of these, as um, the manager said, we have to, to go into executive session. There's some nuances. There's some things about <coughs> the findings that we learned that were uh, confidential and also things that we determined that could potentially impact your position negotiating um, going forward. So. With that, I'll turn it over to Gail to walk you through one more time, just a quick uh, refresh on what is TIF. Thank you, Stephanie. So development challenge, challenges often in, in downtowns um, are, can affect the viability of, pro of projects, brownfields, uh, uh, infrastructure, are just a, 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 an example of those. and. TIF is a, a tool that can be used to help uh, help address that challenge and, and be able to make projects uh, 
move forward a little easier. Uh, so what is TIF? It is a financing tool uh, that, that um, I'm sorry, <laughs> no delight, I'm a little. So it's a financing tool that's used uh, to, to help spur public uh, projects by, uh, build, I'm sorry, building public infrastructure to help spur um, private development in an, in an area that's, that uh, the city has determined or a municipality has determined needs improvement. And um, one of the way, the, the way a TIF district works, and it's kind of a little, uh, little bit in this diagram, is that you start off uh, determining what is the existing uh, uh, value of a property. Um, so for example, um, an existing property may be worth a million dollars today. Um, after redevelopment, that, project, that site then would be worth five million dollars. So the difference between those two, uh, the four million dollars is the increment uh, of growth that's happened on that property. And then for the purposes of TIF, the, the taxes from that four million dollars is what the revenue from that is what's used to help fund projects uh, for the public infrastructure projects. So a municipality it designates a, a TIF district, and it can be, you know, inclusive of potential, ideally, of a ten, a potential projects. Um, sometimes they're they're more uh, more real than others. Uh, the more others may be more speculative, and oftentimes that district will be defined or include a designated downtown, a growth center, or or some some other area with it, including that area. This is uh, Hartford's uh, TIF district uh, area plan. And so the way, what happens, uh, to ha this is a little bit of how TIF works, and I'll just make this fairly quick and simple, but um, when the TIF district is created, uh, the original uh, taxable value of all the properties in the district, district is set, so that's what all the properties currently pay for taxes. So that the any improvements that happen, the increment uh, difference of what the value of the property is today to what the value of the property will be afterwards <coughs> is what is the, the, the uh, funds that the, the, I'm sorry. The debt service. Yeah. <laughs> the debt service uh, will be, it'll be used to pay off the debt service. <laughs> so the TIF, uh, Use, can use both the municipal, um, t a portion of the municipal taxes, but the reason a TIF district is created is because you're going, you're going to be retaining part of the um, state taxes that go to state education. So uh, legislation um, allows up to 70% of, of the state um, taxes to be withheld and used within the TIF district. So that's what happens for 20 years within a district, and then at the end of 20 years, that the total uh, taxes then will be going to both the municipality and the state as they would have before the district was created. So it's a, it's, you're increasing your grand list and improving your um, uh, designated area within your TIF district as a result of TIF. And interestingly, um, I was actually just at <coughs> legislature yesterday testifying um, to a, the Senate committee about TIF. They wanted to know more and kind of an update since they passed the new legislation last year. And in researching that, I found um, a statistic from St. Albans that for the five years before they approved their TIF district, there was $20 million of growth in their grant list. Since that creation of the district, there's been five years since, $65 million growth in their grant in their grand list so you know by a factor of three so that's where at the end hopefully of 20 years it'll grow even further and now you've grown your grand list by that much so that's the hope so um, we we embarked on phase one really it was to determine if Montpelier had viability is it does it have enough projects to uh, and need and demand to be able to is it a good tool for the city? Is it, would it pass the uh, VEPSI standards for the statutory re requirements? We started with just gathering all the data you have so far. Tons of good studies, lots of information, a lot of data already gathered. 
um, then worked with uh, the local folks, city management as well as um, regional development to talk about you know what properties are coming to the forefront and what are their needs, what are their demands, uh, infrastructure demands. And then did some initial number crunching, met with uh, property owners. And what we're really looking for in the viability is to start with what is that infrastructure demand and what, what would be the project viability after the project is uh, the private project is done. Does it fit within statutory criteria? Is there sufficient increment? Is there enough that it would net positive? Our point is to look for net positive at the end of 20 years. Can you pay off the debt service with those incremental taxes? And then cash flow is another piece of it, though, because you may be able to net positive, but are you are you able to cover those early years of debt service, which we'll talk about more in depth in our executive session because I gave you more notes than you needed <laughs> on that. So um, our findings are that um, this is a viable community for a TIF district. What that district looks like is to be determined. There are a lot of factors. There are a lot of um, potential projects that could happen. Again, this is all subject to change. That's what phase two is for, is to actually develop the plan. Um, but by looking at the range of potential projects, we were able to run a bunch of numbers. We were able to um, make some assumptions and plug that in and see that there are a few different ways this could be set up that it could work. So some of the potential projects, we did not list all because some are still confidential. We, talk about, we can talk about that in executive session. But this, a few of the potential projects that stand out are ones that have been talked about a lot in this community. So the Capitol Plaza building, um, the new hotel, but they really can't go forward and do a project without parking. They're, at a li they're just, I mean, <coughs> talk about tight, tight site, and the demand would increase so much. And currently, their parking is being used for the public as well. And so there's just a big constraint there. And downtown parking is really expensive. Um, water and sewer upgrades there as well. And then out on Berry Street, um, the Vermont College of Fine Arts property has been discussed for a possible housing project and then Savins for a possible housing project, which I'm sure that this is news to you, but we learned. It was great. And there are Barry Street improvements that would be needed, the water and sewer to be upgraded, the road, the infrastructure, the bridge there, um, bridge and culverts on that road that have to be upgraded. And those costs really can't be borne by those projects. I mean, those are things that if they, if they could be, they'd be done already. The demand is there, so the, the market is there demanding it, but at the, the rate that would be needed to be able to make those numbers work is not there. I mean, we're not in a place where you can charge, a, you know, you can only charge so much for retail space, office space, housing. So where we got to with this is that um, we, we started digging deeper on at least one of these projects, which is Capital Plaza. Capital Plaza is you are a fortunate community that you have a project that is teed up and ready. It is um, a project that really has mar marketability. It has investors that are at the table ready to ready to invest, but they have this infrastructure demand and they can't. They, they're, they're constrained there, and so we need to do further research and discussions with them to be able to. And by we, I mean city management and and the city as a whole. Um, to, be un to be able to understand what a parking garage would look like, structured parking would look like there. Um, so the parking garage issue, what's interesting is that in some communities, some municipalities, they have a, a, a district that they've put together conceptually. They don't have any actual project that's right there ready. They put together a general roadmap, which is what this is. When we put together the plan, it's just a menu. It doesn't commit the city to anything. It just gives kind of guardrails so that the state knows what to expect. You don't have to go back to the state every single time you want to make a deal um, and do some sort of infrastructure project. <coughs> but they don't really have anybody at the door. So there's that, that model. That was St. Albans. St. Albans had a general idea, but they didn't know exactly what the deal was going to look like. A couple years later, they did a development agreement with the hotel and state office building, and they made it happen. In another, on the other side, Bennington, for instance, already had a deal commitment with their local private entity and said, if TIF passes, this is what we'll do. You guys are in the middle of that, which is um, there's, a, a, there's some will to do a TIF district, but it hasn't been created yet. There's a project that could really use infrastructure help and could support to be able to make this possible and even feasible, but they have to be timed a certain way. So there's a little bit of concurrency happening here, which is where this gets a little bit more complicated, but also more fortunate. Um, so as we looked at this, we said, okay, there's more to be done. There's a lot more to be done. We have to dig in deeper, and we, we're not prepared to come back with a plan yet because that's not part of the, the scope yet. Um, but from what we can tell from these initial readings, this 
bears out very similarly in proportion to other TIF districts that have been approved. So, and you saw some of those materials in your um, <coughs> other material, confidential materials. So when we went ahead and um, mapped out where these parcels were, where the projects were located, um, we actually started with a much bigger map. There were a lot more projects here. We met with VEPSI, we met with the state, and uh, they said, you know, eh, some of these aren't really going to meet the, the test of the project criteria, the location criteria. So we said, all right, let's shrink it up a little bit. Um, and that's where we got to this outline, this, this uh, border boundary. And you can see in this map, which is a little further out, that there's also, uh, this is within the, all of, the, with, of it is within the growth center and a more major portion is within the designated downtown. And that's important. The state cares about that, and I believe that a lot of local people usually care about that as well, because you want to concentrate your growth and your, your stimulation for development in the areas where you've already planned, done all that planning. Can I ask you a question about that? Have sure. you just zoned this to draw a line essentially through uh -huh. there, and this part is rural, and this is yep. proposed for development? So I'm wondering if it's It has to follow property for, line, okay. John. So okay. it has to follow the, the property lines themselves. It can, it doesn't require you to do development in those areas. I would say, you know, if the property line changes, if they create, if they bifurcate or, you know, subdivide, then you could change that. But um, there's no real downside necessarily with making it to incorporate that whole thing. But um, just, it's a good question, though. Um, so here are some of the council, the questions that legislative bodies have asked of us before, and I'm sure you have several others, but these are the kind of litmus tests that we like to make sure we've hit before we go on to the next next step, which is, are these projects, the ones that we're going to talk about more in a moment, um, in, in line with your planning and your development goals? And so, you know, we don't want to put something out there that is, you're not committing to it in the plan, but, you know, it should be city supported, so you don't you want to make sure you're comfortable with it. And then are these the types of projects? Is this the type of infrastructure you could conceive of investing of in the next five to ten years? So it is a five to ten year horizon. Um, so that's why some of this gets more and more speculative. But um, are these the types of projects? And then for our part, we think the next portion of what we'll talk about will kind of ans hopefully answer this is, are there a su su sufficient amount of options that you have confidence that we'll be able to come back with a reasonable plan to you in a few months and have uh, a reasonable approach to how you set this up? So our hope tonight and or in two weeks, <laughs> whatever, whenever you guys decide, is that we would move forward to phase two because we do find this to be a viable district. Um, we need to now spend time gathering more data and putting together the TIF district plan. And how that goes is actually there's a process with if we're going forward in the hope that this is going to, you know, um, become a district, we have to apply to VEPSI with a letter of intent. We have to submit a letter of intent 60 days prior to, to applying to the state. Um, we have to then, then we draft the TIF district plan, bring that to the public and to the council for approval, and then prepare the application that goes to the state. And that is, um, that is the scope of our phase two. That's why I'm calling it that. It's, that's really what the second half of our contract would be. Now, what I mentioned earlier is about Capitol Plaza specifically and about a parking solution here. And so what I want to emphasize is that, again, because you guys are in this unique cir circumstance where you have something very real that's happening as you're also developing the district, these are actually two separate concurrent processes. So setting up your district is not dependent on getting a development deal signed. Setting up your district is not dependent on who is is actively going to make something happen as soon as you sign the papers, but you because you if you if that project is one of the projects you want to include, you want to make sure the most current and the most realistic scenario is included in your TIF district plan, because assuming that that gets approved by the state, <coughs> then you want to be shovel ready and be able to move forward. So we recommend pursuing the development agreement and pursuing even not even the development agreement itself, but the negotiation and the discussion concurrently so that you have, because the right, you need to include the right information in your TIF district plan. That would be a separate contract, not um, inclusive in the phase two. Whitenberg has done this for other companies, specifically our president, David White, has been the person to negotiate development agreements on behalf of other municipalities. Whether or not you hire us is not the point tonight, but just letting you know that that would have to be a second step and it would have to be a concurrent step to what we're working on. 
So just to recap the milestones and timeline, because everyone likes a good timeline, um, or at least I do, uh, due diligence and development discussions would have to happen over the next two months following pending um, your approval of going forward. In February, would be, we'd submit that LOI. And in February, March, we'd spend time developing that TIP district plan with city management, with stakeholders, trying to get input, hopefully um, a core team. And then in April, our plan would be to present this to the public. We'd do a public meeting, hopefully, you know, at a city council meeting, ideally, to be able to present it to you and also <laughs> the, and the public. And then we provide a feedback period so that there's a chance for private property owners who haven't been interviewed yet, who could pr potentially provide more data and input. Um, and then the final version with all that feedback incorporated gets sent to the council for approval in May with a sh quick turnaround, short turnaround, to uh, submit to the state. And, yep. Sorry, uh, yep. what's LOI? Oh, sorry, letter of intent. Oh, okay, letter thank you. Intent. Um, and that's their terminology for that process. And then um, in May, at, after we submit, if we can submit by the end of May, we could potentially even be on the, on the agenda for the VEPC hearings in June, and they take two to three meetings to decide. And the reason we've we've aggressively moved towards this timeline, which is a little bit intense, uh, we've put a little bit of buffers in there, is because if there's a project you want to proceed with in the very next year, because as soon as, I'm gonna double back. If there's a project you wanna proceed with, you might wanna be on the November ballot with that project. If there's an infrastructure project you wanna do, and in order to be on that November ballot, you have to warn that by September and start the, start the voter education, at least in September. So we wanted to build enough time in. And what I'm, where I was about to go with that is that as soon as you, the, vote, the council, vote on the TIF district plan, you've started your clock. You've started your TIF district. You now have 10 years from 2018, let's say, to incur debt, only 10 years, which is not that much time, actually. So you want to make sure you maximize that time and um, to start retain, retaining increment, you have to start um, incurring debt. So, so all of it happens pretty quickly, and it's not committing you to that just by setting up the district, but I put that out there as a fair warning as part of the legislation. All right, I've talked enough at you for now. Um, if there's any questions on that component before we go into executive session, I thought we'd pause. I need one. Questions? I think we're all set on the lights. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank um, you for that presentation. Uh, presumably, if we had something on the November ballot. Sorry, yeah. I had a good question. You needed this for the executive session, too, right? Yes, please. Thank oh. you. So just keep it up there. Yeah, just, yeah. I've got another slideshow for you. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I'm just thinking about our budget process now. Obviously, this is separate from that, and yep. so. Uh, we wouldn't be anticipating any capital improvement um, plans for any of this work at this point. Right. 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 So this is all separate outside of your operating budget. Right, right, right. Okay. Yep. Yep, that's uh, the beauty of it. <laughs> other than, I to ask Phil this question, the additional fund, so if we're going to proceed with with phase two, we need to enter into the contract with White and Burke for the right, next we, section. And that would be in, that's on this and that's budget, the, we would take that from the same reserves and then so I understand that we can put that into, yes. we could roll that into a project. It's a related cost that you put as an explicit line item when you go to the voters so that they know, and then it's reimbursed by the increment. Who wants to go into executive session? I have more slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have any uh, motion to go into executive session? I'm not Don't sure move. the proper. Second. Uh, where we have a site. So yeah, just we have a nice site. So discuss real estate and contractual matters. I so you include Stephanie and Gail and also Sue and Todd. Uh, I would, well, I move that we find that it would uh, put the city at a substantial disadvantage to have this conversation in public. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. And we won't be returning.